Nation, welcome to another live episode of the Outlaw Nation show. Can't thank you enough for joining us here on this lovely Tuesday evening. At least where I'm at, it's a Tuesday evening. You may be morning, maybe afternoon, wherever you're at in the world watching us. I know we have an international audience, so thank you all so much for taking the time to join me again this week. And I thank you again for being patient with me last week when we didn't have an Outlaw Nation show. That was because we had the two-year anniversary on the Tuesday night of me and my girlfriend uh, being together. So we thought we'd take the night off and go celebrate and have a nice dinner someplace so thank you all for being patient but hey if i'm gonna come back i'm gonna come back in a big way and uh i can't wait to introduce you to my guest in just a second i just want to thank you all i just want to tell you all we got so much content going on here in the outlaw nation and i thank you all for joining over the last few days we've gone over thirteen thousand seven hundred subscribers as we keep marching towards that fifteen thousand mark and twenty thousand mark that really establishes the channel even more positively in the sphere so thank you all so much for coming aboard uh we got great content coming up this week we still got the sports show to do tomorrow game time uh me and jay and winston gonna handle that i'll be hosting sen live tomorrow which of course not outlaw nation show but it is me hosting it tomorrow i just finished a deep cut interview with melora walters one of my favorite actresses paul she's worked with paul thomas anderson on a number of movies she's got a new horror western that's coming out and i got to sit down with her for an hour and just talked about talk about acting talk about the movie talk about working with paul thomas anderson and we got into uh depression and mental health and stuff like that and so there was a lot of great conversation that was had there so look for that coming out either later this week or early next week and on friday we do have the new geek buddy show tomorrow but on friday we are uh, dropping our interview with the cast of the spectacular spider-man the animated series uh, that lasted for two years that starred josh Keith the Spider-Man. We had Greg Weissman, Victor Cook, Cheeks Gashon, Cheeks Galloway, Vanessa Marshall, and Josh Keaton join us for a fun conversation. Me, Shannon, and Michael Vogel will talk with them for about an hour about the series and about the show. So look for all this content coming. And of course, I've got a review for Umbrella Season 2, Umbrella Academy Season 2 coming soon as well. All right, enough, uh, enough uh, word vomit about what I've got coming up on the channel. Let's get, uh, without further ado, let's get to my guest tonight i'm excited to bring him on to the show i don't know what's gonna happen we've had our we've had our differences we've had our friendship we've been the best of frenemies someone put it on twitter uh but i've always respected this man as a critic as a writer as a pundit he is an incredibly brilliant writer if you haven't read his stuff he is essentially him and i think him and drew mcweenie are people that if you were to get into film criticism reading their reviews will teach you it's almost like a class every review about how to write a film review you how to look at a film with fresh eyes how to be unique and how you present your point of view on a film he has written for things like ign movies bloody disgusting crave online the rap critically acclaimed uh, or sorry he hosts the critically acclaimed podcast i meant to say uh he's also written for collider and a number of other sites as well i can't keep up with this guy he's always popping up with stuff he's writing but yes you know him from the critically acclaimed podcast as well but also he is the beast in the movie trivia schmodown. He is a former singles champion, fresh off uh, the heels of a victory with uh, with his co with his partner there, Brendan Meyer Shazam, taking care of a final exam, and now they're in a position to uh, possibly go against whoever wins. Uh, well, possibly, I'm sorry, possibly go against the champions if they handle their business on Friday night against my faction mates. Who's the boss? Ben Bateman and Mark Riley. So I'm excited to welcome to the program. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give your hand, clap your hands, give some love for the man, the myth, the legend, William the Beast Bibiani. Hey, everybody. John, are you feeling okay? Because that's the nicest thing you've ever said about me. <laughs> I just want to make sure if you need to true. take a night off or it, no, no, I, I'm kidding. That was very, that was a very, very kind intro. That's Thank true, you. though. I, I've always complimented your writing, brother, and your, your your point of views on things. It's incredible, and Thank even you. if there are films I don't like, William, you find a way to make me kind of like see your point of view, uh, yeah. which is not always the easiest thing for me when I'm reading and I have a strong opinion about something. That's fair enough. That's a, that's that's totally <laughs> fair. It's not a critic's job to like match the point of view of every single person that's reading that's impossible but if you can make it interesting that's all it takes but in any case thank you so much for inviting me on your show uh it's an honor it's a thrill and uh, hi everybody 
<laughs> and remember, gang, we have the Streamlabs and the Super Chats up. You see, the, oh, let me switch the brand here so you Just see everything. Here, I can see you a little better. I apologize. Let's it. take that off. There we go. So I got so many things going on. Yeah. I, some things jump in. But there's the brand. There's Bibi, There's William Bibiani's right. uh, uh, social media there. But right wow. above Bibiani is the Streamlabs address. If you want to send in uh, your donation, send in your support for the show, and ask questions of me or Bibs uh, throughout the show. Uh, and also, you can send in your super chats as well. And don't forget, right above me is the Patreon. Uh, if you want to go and sign up for the Patreon as well. Already been having a lot of study sessions. An hour and a half study session every day with my patrons this week to get me ready for the tag team match on Friday night. So that's some of the perks you get as well that's as being a great a perk. Thank you. Thank you. It's that's a really lot of fun. Perk. I like that one. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, convincing them to come on with interesting questions. It's a fun, yeah. fun conversation. Bibs. But speaking of the schmode. Okay. So you're fresh on the heels of this victory, my man. Yeah, How are you feeling? Exciting. We got, we got a match. Both of us have our match on Friday night. No. How, where are you in, in the process right now of this week? Uh, listen, we are we're we're getting prepped. I mean, we've been filming promos, doing all that nuts and bolts kind of stuff. We've got a strategy in place, and right now it's just a matter of staying motivated, staying positive, doing our research, practicing together, and yeah. trying to put, trying to put on the best match we can. That's yeah. all you can really do. You felt strong, though. Uh, I, I heard you felt really strong after the match. You were on point. You've been doing well uh, with this. And, uh, you know, the Ethernet is the only thing holding you back, I think, yeah. right now. <laughs> I, have a new, I have a new cable. I have a new Ethernet cable. I have a new Ethernet cable. <laughs> I don't know if the problem was me. I mean, listen, let's be honest here. That yeah. match, if you watched it, anyone who didn't watch it at home, we had some Internet connectivity issues. I think part of it was there were like 10 people on at any given time. I think yeah. part of it was we were all doing it at peak hours on a Friday. And it just, you know, it happens. But yeah. I, th I think we're all, I think everyone who's going into play on Friday is cognizant that there were internet problems last week and we all need to do the best we can in order yeah. to, you know, whatever you can do, clear your caches, you know, e exit all your other programs, yeah. to correct directly to your router instead of over the, over the air B and B or whatever <laughs> it is. Like you just, we're all doing the best we can to make sure that doesn't happen again. But yeah. sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes it's not up to you. So. It's true. Do yeah. you feel do you feel reborn lately with this yeah. teaming with uh, with uh, Brendan Meyer, man? Well, I mean, it's been about a year since we uh, teamed mm -hmm. up for the first time, so it doesn't feel like new. Okay. So I wouldn't call myself reborn, but I do feel like now that we are back together and playing together, yeah. that the Schmodown feels right again. You know, like it's I, I really I mean, listen, my first teammate was Whitney Seibel. He's my yeah. podcast co-host. We have a wonderful rapport. We know each other inside and out. Mm. But in a way that actually kind of worked against us, because after working together for so long, we kind of knew the same stuff. Uh, so yeah, we were a strong competitor. And I and I still think Whitney hasn't had the best of luck in the Schmodown outside of critically acclaimed. But mm -hmm. I don't think anyone can look at any of his matches and say that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just had bad luck. So right. we did really well. But when I'm working with Brendan, it's just it's a little different he approaches the game differently he has a slightly different set of knowledge uh than i do there are categories yeah. some of them have never come up but there are categories that he knows inside and out that mm -hmm. aren't my wheelhouse and vice versa and i just yeah. feel like together we complement each other rather than just overlap yeah so i think i think i think when i'm working with the kid i think i'm a better pl uh, player a better competitor and i think that actually bleeds over into my singles career because oh, wow. working with the kid as a team and, you know, training each other and working together to prep for, uh, we're both in the singles tournament and we're both helping each other prepare for that. Yeah. Um, I think that actually makes both of us stronger and we're both keeping our heads in the game and we're both keeping ourselves like strategizing and talking right. about different opponents we could face because that tournament is a monster this year. It it, you know, we call you the beast, but that tournament is a beast. It's a, it's, yeah. you're right. It's a monster. So many great players. Uh, and even the play in games are not givens in terms of the people you're going to face when you get to that situation. I mean, I've got to face yeah. James Collins. I think his name is James Collins. He, he can't, he came in and destroyed Gallegos. And uh, so everyone's like, oh, this guy's a killer. He's coming out of the fan leagues. I think you've got, who have you got? To, is there a play in game that we uh, got? There was, there, there was a play in game. It, it already happened with James White. Right. Uh, so so you've got to play. I, I'll be playing James White in the yeah. near future. I think that match isn't until. Actually, I think we got a couple of weeks before that match because we got right. a, a whole bunch of stuff. But uh, I mean, okay. he had, uh, you know, that first match he had was strong. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've seen his family stuff and I've seen him do even better than that. Yeah. So I'm taking yeah. that match incredibly seriously. You just got to. 
Yeah, Got I apologize. One, two, three, Narnia. Adam Collins, I apologize. Yeah, I was Adam about Collins. to. I was. I was. I was actually yeah. literally on my computer double checking that. I'm like, <laughs> Jason I Collins is a Adam basketball Collins. player, so my bad. My okay. bad. But yeah. See, this is this is where not knowing basketball helps me. <laughs> Because that's point. just not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, we have, we've got the uh, Streamlabs and Super Chats open, people. So please send in your questions. Send in your support for the show. We have one already from Tushka Productions. He said, I love seeing you two in the same room. I got to say, I shed a single tear every time I see the clip of Roka winning his first belt and Bibbs hugging the hat off of him. Yeah, it seemed, <laughs> that was a lifetime ago, man. That was an emotional <laughs> moment. I was really I, – I, we, we've talked about that, and you've yeah. talked about, like, how, like – that was me inserting myself into whatever. That was part of the storyline. That was part of the storyline. But I, I yeah. want to, I want to clarify that I was really, really happy for you. Well, thank you, man. I That's was enormously fair. happy for you. I was proud to be on a faction with you that day. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a pleasure because you're one of those people who you take it real hard when you lose, but you also that also means that when you win, it means that much more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that, that, it's it's exciting to watch a player like you who takes it so emotionally, good and bad. So yeah. you know, it, it's. I wanted to ask you something because you sure. had uh, you had a rough match against Ethan Irwin and it came down to the wire. Yeah, yeah. it was real tough, and we saw that it hit, it hit real hard at the end there. Yeah, were you you you've talked a couple of times after you've had a tough match? Yeah. about maybe this is the end for the outlaw. And in the moment, how much do you really believe that? Like, how close are you actually to retiring at any? Given oh, time? yeah. I think when I've brought it up those two times after a match. Yeah. Um, those two specific times that I did go into a little bit of a soliloquy about it, uh, yeah. uh, feeling myself a little too much. I, I would say that, yes, yeah, I was serious sure. when I'm talking about it at the time uh, because it feels so overwhelming to come so close and to lose in such a way that's reminiscent of at least a cousin to other ways that I've lost in the past. I, it was at the time, it just felt like, here we go again. The fans are just going to give me crap for this. They're going to use this as a barbed to shoot at me all the time. Like I, I still get yeah. Bespin jokes. I yeah. still get Jane Fonda jokes. Even from the competitors, they throw in. They Jane have a, Fonda they jokes. have a long memory. Those fans. I still oh, get yeah. jokes about like how like oh he's just going to whiff it again in the last question. I'm like I haven't done that in a while. Yeah. But like it's people have a long long memory, and yet there's also a recency bias. I don't know how it works. That's true. That's a great point. A recency right. bias for certain things, but not yeah. a recency bias if it affects their overall narrative about how they see you a yeah, thousand percent but yeah in the in, I, mel I, I meant it in that moment because i mean I'd, I'd worked bams i'm not gonna lie i know i say this after every match but for real i spent hours upon hours studying for him i took almost every night three hours having the barbarian sending me text questions yeah. over and over and over and over again however we didn't veer into 1930s universal horror films and and <laughs> is that what you're studying is that what you're yeah, ready for we, we, that, i had no concept that that was going to be a question <laughs> uh, and then when and then when uh, of course i know who directs tootsie it came to me right at the last minute i just think my brain had fogged over from being in a sudden death match which i've never been in before i don't think i'm trying I to either. stay yeah i don't think yeah. I, I don't i don't envy that that's got to be a, this real big added level of pressure because like yeah. well you you had, you had sudden death in teams oh right and then we lost in the yeah, first yeah. We in the first round so, so extra you know. extra level yeah. of intensity there yeah that, that really really sucks but um yeah. yeah i mean that's the thing with sudden death it's got to be sudden because the whole point is we're trying to decide the match yeah you know we want this thing to be over that's why everyone only gets one jte it's like listen that's we're true it's over. You both did great, but seriously, we need to call this thing. We all want to go home. <laughs> RB3 has to, like, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, I guess he's not actually doesn't have to pack anything up anymore, but you know what I mean? But, like, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's rough, man. I, that, I, that match was, like, I was feeling that match in my soul. Dude, like, I, I but, was just like, you know, oh, that's such a hard match. I had him. I had him, dude. If, I take, if I take that repeat... If I and get to Boris Karloff and I could because there's only three people you need to think about or four yeah. if you want to throw in James Whale. There's only really three people that are going to be asked about, and that's Lon Chaney Jr., Boris Karloff, or Bella Lugosi. Maybe you get an Elsa Lanchester question. Yeah, uh, maybe? Uh, Claude Rains was in a lot of those. Oh, too. Rains, right, with Invisible Claude Man. Rains, yep. Claude Rains was in. He was the Invisible Man. He was also the Phantom of the Opera. He was also right. the Wolfman's father. Um, oh, so there's Wolfman. a few others, but like, but. Yeah, you're right. It's when you come to the Universal Monsters, unless maybe you get the monster movies category, it's probably yeah. going to be pretty, pretty general, especially in the first round, right? Oh, but yeah. I, I, yeah, I think yeah. I was so surprised that he had missed the second question of the match that I wasn't ready to be up on him. I wasn't ready mentally yeah. to be up on yeah. him. So that's that's the work I, I. So when I took a few days away, 
I just kind of realized I need to stop being so wound up about these matches. I've established myself. Whatever yeah. happens from here happens from here, but people know who I am and what I can do. Uh, so if I can just relax, play the game, be okay with whatever the swings are, uh, then I think I'll be more level-headed when I play and more relaxed if it goes in my favor. Um, and so th those are things I want to avoid uh, in the future because the emotional drain, because at this age, the emotional drain is not worth it. It's really not worth it. No, it's not. It's 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 way too hard. And I think the, the Shmodan has become not just a competition about movie trivia, not just like an entertaining show yeah, in which yeah. we all play characters. Um, it's become like this weird, pervasive series of mind games. And kind of, <laughs> frankly, yeah. I'm kind of over it. I yeah. just kind of just like, because I think what it boils down to is the mind games only work if you let them work. And then it's just a matter of who knows the most. Right. So right. just play the game and, you know, like sometimes people can get into your head and that can cost you a match. But yep. no matter who you are, if you can't answer the questions right, you will not win. Yeah. So yeah. as long as you're just cool and you're over it and like you, 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 it sucks because I think early on or maybe after you've had a series of losses, you start to almost define yourself by whether or not you can win. Yeah. And you start taking it real personal and it's really important to you. and. Yeah. I, I'm 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 past that now. I mean, I want to win, and we're trying to win, and we take it really, really seriously. But you know, this coming match on Friday, for example, is one where I actually feel really zen about it. Like the kid and I are in a good place. We're very, yeah. very confident. We're going to play our hearts out, and I honestly think we can win. We beat the team that beat who's the boss mm -hmm. at the tournament last year, so yeah. we know that we're we're on the same level at least. But here's the thing: even if we lose, we go into the team's tournament. It's not right. the end of us for the season. Right. And honestly, we probably will have more opportunities to win points in the tournament mm -hmm. than we even with the title shots so there's a big silver lining here yeah, so i yeah. don't have a, i'm not feeling a lot of intensity going into this match i i care but i'm not like worried yeah, yeah, way yeah, I, yeah. Was. I was worried last week because this is like our first chance to play mm -hmm. in like seven months right so i was like i just want to make sure man i we wanted to win but we just wanted to make sure that we stayed on the radar and showed that we still got it because if we didn't if we crashed and burned real bad you know that would that would stink and <laughs> it would kind of kill whatever was left of our momentum after last year, but we pulled it out and we're feeling really strong. So yeah, yeah you guys are to I love the kid, man. I think he's a great balance right. for you. And I, I absolutely agree with you that like, he's a good, uh, he has knowledge in other areas that you might not have. And so yeah. that's a nice thing for It takes like a load off when you have a, when you have a partner like that. And look, I loved playing with Nose, but the same thing like you, yeah. I knew what Nose knew and he knew what I knew. We knew a lot of similar stuff and there was you no brand. The same stuff. You're on the same podcast for so many years. And exactly. Right? We yeah. Yeah. And having Dan on is, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better partner than Dan and Dan has gone next level over the last few yeah. months. And it's like incredible to watch. You, I mean, it's like Jordan has another gear and you're like, is this possible? And so I'm, I'll take your word for that. I assume that that's that's a thing. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's right. George, <laughs> I, it's interesting because there are so many people who are in the schmodown because they like competition and they're super into sports. But yeah. I also think there's a lot of people in the schmodown who maybe don't always get represented in the conversation who were into movies because we're art kids you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're not into the competitive sports much we come at it from loving movies and as a result i mean there have been times where people have thrown out these like there's this happened on on camera actually you were talking okay. to me about a rubber match i had literally no idea what you were talking about i thought you were making something up and i made a joke oh, about no it idea. Like, i literally had actually. no i literally had no idea and so when i said do i have to wear rubber i thought we were both being silly yeah i didn't realize that was an actual thing until <laughs> afterwards christian who was busting a gut explained to me what it meant and yeah. i was like oh <laughs> no one tells me this i went into movies because i'm bad at sports well let's let's talk about that at the risk yeah. of taking a little bit of a difficult segue this is something that i've seen like i saw him backstage you made a comment once a few weeks ago and mm -hmm. other things you've spoken about that you feel like the game doesn't want you in it is that a real feeling that you feel like people want oh. you out of the schmodown or that there's not a place for you in the schmodown i feel like the way I uh, kind of. I feel like uh, uh, when I started at the Schmodown, because of my entrance and because I had a really strong first bet, first match, yeah. uh, I got like thrown into this heel persona. And I that was actually never what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be the wacky entrance guy, and that happened yeah. to be the first one that I did. And um, everyone was like, you'd be a great heel. And I'm like, are you sure? I don't really think that's my wheelhouse. But I tried, and you can see me trying, and you can see how really bad I was at it. I hopefully it was entertaining, but it was never I was never comfortable with it. Right. And since then, I found that I'm kind of like this 
spoiler kind of character where I'll just come in and sometimes I'll be a little egomaniacal, but mostly I'm just trying to be wacky, have fun, break the fourth wall, yeah. that kind of thing. And as a result, it's kind of hard to build like conventional storylines around me. And so sometimes right. I feel like I don't really fit into a lot of the directions of where the show is going. It's hard to like fit me in anywhere, but I still play well enough and I get all of these big matches that I, you can't get rid of me either. So... <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I feel a little lost. Sometimes I feel okay. like I don't know what my identity is supposed to be in the league. So I basically just said, I'll be me. And yeah. I will do what I want to do. And I'll play it the way I want to play it. I will make jokes the way I want to make jokes. If they don't like them, they can cut them out. That's that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's not so much that I feel like unwanted. I definitely don't feel unwanted. I know everyone here is really, really nice and yeah. respectful and they care about all the players. That's not it. At all. I just sometimes feel like everyone else knows all of this sports stuff, knows all of this wrestling stuff, yeah. understands certain ideas of how, you know, sporting competitiveness is supposed to go. And me, I just love movies. And yeah, I'm competitive. You know I'm competitive. Yes, but yes, yes. I'm more competitive in the way that, like, people that like board games are competitive, where it right. doesn't really affect me most of the time. But if we start playing Battleship, I'll take it really seriously. <laughs> and that's kind of where I am with the Schmodown. So. Right. Right. That, that's that's kind of it. I just I feel a, a bit like an outlier sometime, but I don't feel like an outsider because everyone's really nice. Yeah, an outlier. That's a great point to put an outlier. I, I would agree with that and, and because you are not not they don't normally build the storylines around you much over the last year uh, because yeah, you're yeah, the you're, nice one with the kid, but that was about it, really. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah. But then the, the still standing stuff has really helped you. Uh, the free for all performances have been incredible. Not a lot of people can do what you do in that way, and so I found that to be phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, that was that was a hell of a day. And boy, was I bummed out that you know everything that happened like the week before free for all because I was really looking forward to it again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's one of those events where. You listen, a lot of the Schmodown isn't just the movie trivia. A lot of it is gameplay. But when you strip all that away and you're just asking questions, yeah. that gives a lot of people an opportunity to shine who might not have an opportunity otherwise due to things like luck of the wheel or right. scheduling issues or whatever. And so you get someone like Brendan Meyer who, you know, he had already had his rookie debut. Yep. He had a very respectable showing, but he lost. And that can kind of... There, there are some people who never get to play again just because they lose their, their rookie match. Yep. And because of free for all, he was able to show people, no, he, he knows his stuff. Right. Like he can hang with a lot of the top tier players. And in fact, and I think if you look at the first match of the season, well, the second mm -hmm. after guy and uh, Burnett, but like, yeah. if you look at the match between me, the kid and Dan, it was a great like, match. I'm very proud of that match. We all only missed one question in that entire match. He hung right in there and ended yep. up being only one point away, not just from the record, but from beating Dan Merle. Yep. And I think that's incredibly impressive. And I think if it wasn't for free for all, he might not have had the opportunities. He might not have had the support of the fans mm -hmm. needed to get to that point and show just how amazing he is at this game. So I love free for all because it gives people an opportunity to really shine. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Some people are asking if my mic is echoing. I do hear it. So maybe I, do, I don't actually. Okay, but good. Okay, okay. Good. I just want to make sure. Uh, let me select the right mics. Maybe the switch over will help. How's that? Am I, can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, cool. All right. You sound, you sound the same to me, but I don't know. If every people are having trouble, I don't know. I'm not hearing the echo anymore. So hopefully that's our, hopefully that solves that problem. All right. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and you know, it's, it, I'm envious of what you can do in that free for all. Cause I'm always, I always want to be in there all the way at the end, but I, I usually get knocked out around to five rounds in and it's uh super frustrating cause I really yeah. want to stay in there. But in the end, there's only so much I can do. Uh, what, what preparation do you go into for something like that, my man? Well, I mean, a lot of it is just mental preparation. You know, okay. I just, I remember when I was going into the free for all, um, for free for all three, the year that I made it all the way to the end, um, yeah. I knew I knew my number was number one, and I was not happy, as you can yeah. imagine. I was like, oh, "Come on!" Because <laughs> what are the odds? What are the odds that I could possibly even get close to winning right, this? Right. And what I ended up like on the drive over, I was kind of psyching myself out a little, and then I was like, "Okay, you know what? Screw it. 
I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try to make it all the way to the end. I am going to do everything I can to make that the narrative. Not that yeah. Bibbs was first and, of course, he got knocked out quickly because, of course, he would he was first. Right. I wanted to break the game. <laughs> I wanted to. I went out there. I'm like, if I make it all the way to the end, or if I last 30 rounds, or at least, or something like that. I, the very least, yeah. I set a standard that's going to be real hard to beat in the future. And I just, I, I kind of was just like, I just wanted to like punch back a little bit at my number, you know? <laughs> just so it was. I was motivated by breaking the system, and I, and that was a big deal for me. But yeah. when it comes down to like preparing for the game, I mean, here's the thing with the free for all. Some questions are harder than others, but the yes. majority of them are one que point questions, maybe a two point question here or there. Right. So there's just general knowledge. And I feel very confident about my general knowledge in film. And so yeah. it's not so much about I have to know more than everybody. I have to get everyone right all the time. I just have to not get the fewest right, right. every match. So every time the thing reset. I mentally just completely reconfigured back to zero. What happened before doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I got five or three. Yeah. This is all over again. We're just flipping the coin all over again, and the odds are exactly the same as they were last time. Right. So you just stay in there. You stay confident. You trust your knowledge. I firmly believe that, well, specialization can get you really far yeah. in the mowdown. Like if you really memorize a couple of wheel slices, that can get you really, really far. But if you don't get those wheel slices, yeah need to fall back on general knowledge you mm -hmm. need to have a good working knowledge of all of film history and keep up with every single genre whether or not you're particularly a fan of it which yeah. i think trips up some people yeah so you don't get to pick and choose you have to know everything and i've had this philosophy where there are no bad genres from pretty much all my life so i've been studying everything for about 30 years wow. so yeah. i i feel pretty good in my baseline knowledge which is why i usually do pretty good in round one yeah, like, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't ace it every time, but I'm usually very strong. And in singles, that's really, really important because you know you never know what you're going to get in round two. Round three is a crapshoot, and round one is all over the place. But in teams, the first round is the most important round. Yeah, I firmly yeah. believe this. If you because in first round you can get as many as eighteen points. Right. So if you need two general knowledge care, uh, uh, players, if you really want to clean up. Yeah. in teams and i know i i had that with whitney seibold and i know i have that with the kids so i'm feeling pretty good absolutely man yeah i mean it's it's that's the thing that you learn after a few years in the game you figure out where it is and I, i'm in the kick as well with you like i don't think just teams i think singles the first yeah. rounds are important as well Very certainly important. if i if i go up two points on ethan going in and everything stays the same i win by two points so he exactly. those you know you got to build your foundation that first round doesn't mean you can't come back certainly we saw the kid come right. back after missing those first two questions uh in the in the recent match and you guys okay. got the victory there is opportunity to get those points back but sometimes if you have a good first round it can actually buy you a little leeway in the second or third round to stay alive so you know every i think yes those second and third rounds are important because they're uh more points in term per question but yeah. in the first round you could really set yourself up with a strong foundation and kind of psychologically work on the other person who feels like they're in a deficit constantly yeah. throughout the match so you, just you never, never want to play from behind you yeah. never want to play from behind you always want to be leading whenever you can and sometimes that's, right. that's possible and sometimes it's not yeah. and uh, even and even you know in the second round you can be up and then you let them go first and then they ace the category and then oh i'm really behind now and you got to just yeah. remember and i'm just going to get these questions and i'll get them right or i'll get yeah. them wrong yeah and that's all it boils down to you can strategize all you want but in the end <laughs> in the end in the end all that matters is do you know the questions yeah do you feel confident in everything on there you can plan yeah. for two or three wheel slices or even a dozen wheel slices but there's no guarantee you're going to get any of those and right. you just need to be able to answer whatever you got and then you either know it or you're able to figure it out in a multiple choice situation yeah. process of elimination do the best you can sometimes you just know every single question and you feel like you're walking on air and sometimes it's a it's you have to fight your way through and you mm -hmm. have to go off of what you kind of remember or what kind of makes sense to you right. and sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't yeah. and that's really all it boils down to is you know again strategize all you want doesn't matter do you know the movies that's what counts yeah strategize all you want study all you want if yeah. the questions don't fall in your favor there's not much you can do and especially in singles and teams it's an infinite yeah. number of films Yep. Yep. Infinite. Exactly. Infinite number of, and you never, and there's yeah. new questioners every year. So we yep. never know who is going to be contributing what 
in these questions. So, you know, that's that's the things you have to navigate and, and uh, uh, find out for yourself as you play yeah. the game. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you mentioned something uh, earlier about, the, uh, you know, you've been, do, uh, you know, uh, watching these movies for 30 years. Uh, real quick, we're at the we're at the half an hour mark. Guys, there haven't been many streams on or Super Chats. What's going on? If you love the Outlaw Nation channel, you love the Outlaw Nation show, and you love Bibbs being on the show, send in your support. You know, the channel lives and breathes he, on the He will never have me in. on again if you don't. <laughs> If you don't do any stream labs or anything. So That's there you true. go. Come on, people. Send Great it in. And, 100, and we got 124 of y'all in here uh, and only 94 likes. So get us over 100 likes as quickly as possible. And we'll start marching towards 150 likes as well. We do have one stream lab that came in from Boris Lagosi. Oh, thank you, Boris Lagosi. Uh, <laughs> Bibbs, what do you think about the point system this season and how competitors have opted out of contender shots just to get points for their faction? What's yeah. more important to you? What's more important to you, belts or your faction winning at the end of the year, Bibbs? You know, that's a really good question, and that's something we're all adjusting to. And mm. I think some uh, factions have focused a lot on winning points, and some factions have just focused more on winning the matches in front of them. Yeah. Um, I think the what it boils down to in the end is that the faction points are for the manager. Yeah, And I think what each individual player should be focusing on is winning their games. Yeah. And I appreciate that a few players have had decisions to make. And Mike had a tough decision ahead of him. Do I try to win belt and potentially have a lot fewer opportunities to win points in the singles tournament, which is mm -hmm. very, very long this year. So that's actually, that's a gamble. It's a big yeah. gamble. Yeah. But it, it kind of makes sense. But at the same time, I think as a player, he had a clear path. Yeah. To victory, and I think you know Mike is a player who's he's one of those really focused players. He's pretty good at general knowledge. He's got a couple of categories that he knows super mega well, and he can yeah. fight his way through the rest. He's come within a hair's breadth of having a singles title shot before. Sure, no slouch. I think he really could have taken Andrew Guy. I honestly think. Oh that yeah. Would it would have been a good match, but I honestly think he had a really good shot that against Andrew game. Guy, and that would have led him directly uh, uh, into a match against Dan. I. Yeah. Personally, I don't think I would have made that choice, but he made a choice. He decided that because corruption is so close, he really wanted to maybe try to get the faction points. That's a decision you make, and there are tough calls to be made yeah. throughout this entire thing. It's I can't imagine like what it's like right now for like a manager who has like let's look at the Finstock Exchange for yeah. example. Like let's say hypothetically, mm -hmm. and and who knows what will happen, but like let's say hypothetically, okay. founding fathers aren't champions after this weekend. Right. That means you have two all pre-existing top tier teams. Yeah. That potential and, and let's say who's the boss loses as well. Yeah. Then, yeah, it, yeah. then it's a matter of only one of you can play in the team's tournament. That's a tough call. Wow, I didn't know that. I thought Did both you, of us could go in. There's only one. I don't think. I don't think. Oh. You, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a. It's a. I think it's a small tournament this year. It's wow. my understanding. Okay. That it's only one team per faction. That's a lot of pressure, and yeah. that's something I don't envy a manager having to decide. I don't envy players having to make decisions. Hell, I yeah. think it's really, really rough in the singles tournament. That like, listen, every faction has. I think they have ten. I think a couple have nine players, but yeah, like, yeah. you only get four. Yeah. That's a lot of people who some of them never got to play this season at all. Yeah, yeah. Cody has really? not played a game. Yeah, Drake is died. not a play game for us. Yeah, it's it's a yeah. it's a shame and, the way it's all worked out. Yeah, and, and, and of course, COVID, and it's all yeah. weird, and that's fine. I totally get it. Yeah. Th there's a lot of things that would happen very, very differently in any other year. We can all agree on that. Right. But it's the whole landscape has changed. The priorities have shifted, and we're making decisions about what counts when. Decisions have had to be made about you know things that kind of weren't predicted, like initially at the beginning of the year. Yeah when the Finstock Exchange was up against the Finstock Exchange for a belt. And right. then the question was, okay, that's just basically feeding points to the Finstock Exchange right. or whatever faction would get in that situation. And Christian had to think about the rules a bit there and make some yeah. adjustments because we're all doing this for the first time. And yeah. when you're doing anything for the first time, there's a little trial and error. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when it, basically what it comes down to me to answer the question directly, it's just uh, points matter. 
But as a player, I'm concerned about my matches, and I'll leave the managing uh, uh, team, in this case it's Koi, uh, uh, to make the ultimate priority the overall faction points. Yep, so I'm I don't, just focusing on my matches. I don't disagree with Bibbs at all. I feel that way too. And maybe because we're old school guys who you who were used to, you know, playing for the belts. That's what mattered to us. That's what matters yeah. when we're in our and, and there's a pride we take in uh being someone that is winning these matches or knows more movie about movies than maybe our competitor does in a certain moment. Because of the swings of the match, it works out in our favor. So we like that. I'm in the same boat as well. Look, I, yeah, would I like to get points and help the Finstock exchange overall? Sure. But yeah. my pursuit is the belts. What I'm establishing yeah. the outlaw is my legacy. My legacy is not tied to the Finstock Exchange, nor yeah. would it be tied to any faction I go into next year if it's not the Finstock Exchange. My yeah. legacy is my legacy, and so that's what I'm working towards: winning matches, winning belts. Yeah. That's what matters uh, to me, and uh, you know, it's th those are the things I strive for. Which is why I didn't uh, make the Kalinowski decision. Christian put it on the plate. For me, he said, do you want to skip the Ethan match and go into the tournament and try to get your faction some points? And I was like, no, I I, I measure myself by playing the best. And Ethan yeah. is one of the best. Uh, and so I, I had to play him for myself. Uh, and yeah, I didn't get the job done, uh, but I, I didn't walk away from that match feeling like um, I didn't know as much as Ethan. Uh, yeah, and so, well, you know, Matt, what can you do? Someone's got to lose. Someone's got to lose. Two brilliant competitors up. Someone's got to lose. It's right. not. It's not fun. And I, but, and I lost, but and I didn't lose by not knowing the answer. I knew yeah. the answer, just didn't do it legibly, and that's how it goes sometimes. So what can you for do? me, yeah, exactly. What can you do? As, for yeah. me, that's the situation. So yeah, yeah, for me, it's definitely all about the belts, not about the points necessarily. And it's also but, worth noting that I think you know the managers. What, what's the big prize? Like the biggest prize for right. faction points is we have manager. no idea what it is well yet. he said that the manager will the winning manager will get this like extra week in order to talk to players and choose the three players that they want to keep in that's not for the whole faction that's for the manager yeah right the, why manager, am I, could, the manager could boot all of us out and try to pick another three why am so, i working hard to yeah. make sure you get an extra week yeah, well, i exactly. mean we do that because we have faith in our managers we like our manager yeah Hopefully you sure. do i love mine but like <laughs> it's I, I i can't speak for everybody but i love my manager coy's been great to me stop and, taking shots yeah go ahead <laughs> I, I don't, not taking shots at anybody i just if anyone out there there's not a player out there you're just like yeah. my manager is a jerk well i'm sorry i'm not <laughs> speaking for you but i'm speaking for me i love my manager but at right. the same time the, the award is for the manager yeah. i'm a player i'm focusing on playing the games that my manager sets up for me that's yeah. all i can do. yeah fair point uh we yeah. got a few more that rolled through here we do have one we'll get back to in just a second because i do want to get into these questions about film with bibs vincent zawan i want to recognize he said hey bibs who's your favorite directors and movies we'll oh. circle back to that one i promise we'll circle back yeah. to that one as we that's get into the, yeah larger film discussion because i do yeah. i do want to talk to bibs about that uh, uh drunken prayer says bibs for the return to live events have you and the kid discussed any entrance ideas always thought you had the yeah. most fun entrances in the schmodown also can you give roca some study tips <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i'll take uh, his brain i'll take his brain yeah. that's what i would uh, you, you well i'll say this right now you, you know it's kalinowski so i hope you guys have been studying bond like, oh yeah, that's, that's no, that's no secret. I just want right. to make sure you are right. I think Bond and IG are probably going to end up on the oh, wheel. We, that's or, very safe. or something or they similar might, anyway. They might go Viola Davis. They might go Tyler well, Perry. You never know. They, they've so. all, we've everyone, uh, pretty much everyone has had the time yeah. to like build up new strengths over uh, the last eight months or however long it's been since yeah. they played. Uh, so there's, it's a dangerous time, and you never know what someone has been building up for you. Yeah. Random thing on the wheel, you get opponent's choice, you think, oh, they couldn't possibly be good at random thing number one. And it turns out they've seen all of random thing number one's movies. Yeah. So that's that's a risk. That's a general risk that uh, we're, we're all concerned about. Uh, what was the other question? Entrances. Have you guys entrances, been working on entrance? Entrances are weird in the digital era because you can't really enter. You know, they, you kind of pop in. Yeah. And we tried to play with that a little bit. Like you popped in on us like mid-conversation last week. And we've got some ideas. But what we're trying to do, I think, more than anything else is focus more on the promos because yeah. that's the area. Right now, the promos are kind of taking the place of entrances in a mm -hmm. lot of ways because basically just like here are your screens. Hey, you guys ready to go? We sure are, Mr. Harloff. And then <laughs> that's basically it. You don't have a lot of room to do anything super duper crazy. So yeah. that bugs me because I love the theatricality. I also love being able to use the language of cinema because these are all film yeah. uh, to sort of 
you know, add to my personality in the Schmodown and just celebrate. I think the Schmodown is at its heart a celebration of film. And I think sometimes yeah. when we focus on the sport, we lose a little track of that. Mm-hmm. And I like to refocus that. Okay. Um, so we have some ideas or some stuff we'd like to do, but there are simple factors of when you're doing it live digitally, there are certain things you can and cannot do for practical reasons or you right. cannot prepare for. Um, and uh, it's a little different. So we're focusing on making fun promos and hopefully we'll be able to do a few fun things down the road. But oh, we, will see, we will see if how many matches we even play. You know, <laughs> that's like that's, that's a big question. We don't know. So hopefully as time goes on, we'll win more matches and we'll have more opportunities to do fun stuff. There you go. Uh, Andrew H wants to know, Bibion, if there was another competitor that you can form another team with, who would you love to have? And what competitor would be a weird choice that you would be, <laughs> you would be comfortable with? And why is it John? I'm kidding. That's another <laughs> choice. <laughs> uh, I think I think you and me teaming up would break the internet. I think that would be a weird. It'd be fun, actually. If they oh, ever like be the anarchy, that'd yeah. be a lot of fun. I would love to at least give that a shot. But mm-hmm. first off, I want to make it clear: I love the kid, and I don't want to break up with the kid. Of However, so. if something happened, let's say the kid got cast in a big movie, and he had to take a break from the Schmodown for a year or something, and I had to find another partner. Yeah. My dream partner. Yeah. yeah, my dream partner is Rachel Cushing. Wow. She's retired. Okay. She's retired. Of course she's retired, but that would be yeah. the first person I would go to and say, Hey, I know you I know you got a connection to the usual suspects, but wouldn't it be fun? Yeah. And she would probably say no because she's got her own things going, but that would be the only per- the first person that comes to my mind. I like that um, idea. Yeah. Uh someone who's weird, I mean <sighs> Tom. I think Tom would hey, Tom is a fierce competitor. Oh Tom. Like Tom. Tom. Yeah. Not okay. like Tom, Tom. Tom, yeah. Tom, 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 Tom. Right. Like, right. I think Tom is a wonderful competitor, and I think I love his character work, and I think it would be fun to be – I think anyone would have fun being on a team with Tom. I think there's a few yeah. people who maybe just don't have that theatrical spirit and it would be kind of weird. Yeah. But I think if you have any kind of, like, sense of humor with this league, I think Tom, as almost anyone's partner, would be a blast, and he can back it up with great gameplay. Yeah. So that's someone else who I was thinking to myself, like, you know, Tom would be a fun competitor. Like, if again, if we ever did an anarchy again, yeah. Tom would be fun. Tom yeah. would be a lot of fun. Um, and I have a great team name, but I would never tell anybody unless it happened. <laughs> that's smart. I have the most brilliant name. A big man. <laughs> um, uh, real quickly, if I, yeah, if Dan and I were to ever break, I think uh, teaming up with Ben Bateman would be an interesting situation between yeah. us. We probably implode before the season was over, but it would be fascinating to watch. You, you're um, both you're both used to the spotlight. That's the yeah. thing. Like yeah. you know, like it, that's that's tricky because you know Dan is a great player, but he's also. You know, he's also very mild mannered in a yes, lot of ways. And yes, that's the same yeah. with thing with Mark Riley. So I, I that would be my concern is that you that, guys would literally murder each other. I don't disagree with you. To to be the front man or to be the alpha dog in yeah. there. Yeah, I agree. Uh weird. Um, I don't know if there's a weird choice. You said Tom Tom's good. Um, maybe Lawn. I would love to team with Lawn, but I'd be so frustrated the whole time because he's doing too much character work that it yeah. might frustrate me, but it it would be fun to chill with him because he's so smart about films and knows a lot about them. You know who I think you would be great for? Who'd be like not a, an obvious choice? Okay, it would actually be Whitney Seibold because he's another one. He's got the knowledge, but what he mm-hmm. needs is someone—a manager, a partner, someone who can basically handle the strategy yeah. and keep him invested in here. And also, you don't have the exact same knowledge. You've got uh, categories. True that he doesn't have. And uh, I think Whitney is one of those players who he's kind of like guy. He's a great teammate. Yeah. Uh, His singles, you know, is, is up and down, but like as a teammate, he's a monster. And I think that's the kind of thing where if he teamed up with someone like you, you could be unstoppable. I think. Could be. Riley's another one. Riley's another one. Yeah, that was going to, that was originally going to be the pairing, not me and Dan. It was going to be me and Riley, but then things ah. kind of worked out in a certain way. So uh, it went that route. All right. Alan Smith, he says, Hey, Roke and Bibbs, growl, Ooh. growl. Uh, I'll growl. Bibbs, glad to see you back in action with Shazam. Also love watching you in horror matches. Bibbs, what attracts you to the horror genre and what horror film would you be in if you had to survive the whole Ooh. run the whole time? Oh, if I had to survive the whole time, that's tricky because I got a bad knee, so I can't run. Um, <laughs> as a result of that, I would think it would probably, to answer the second question first, I think I could probably survive a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Okay. Uh, because I'm pretty, like, I, I'm kind of lucid in my dreams a lot of the time, so I think okay. I could 
at least put up a good fight. Uh, but what attracts me to the horror genre, the horror genre is one of the things that got me into film in the first place. I was a very frightened kid. Mm. I was scared of Jason Voorhees. I was scared of Freddy Krueger. I was scared of all of these monsters. And, you know, I was sleeping with my light on all the time. And yeah. it wasn't until... I found basically Fangoria magazine. I don't remember if it was specifically Fangoria. Oh, wow. It might have been Starlog or one of those. But I was looking at like magazines and like the way horror movies were made. And I realized yeah. that all of these things that scare the crap out of me, uh, they're made. People yeah. go to work and they come up with these ideas and they build them out of rubber and goo. And people you know, scream, ah, and then they go <laughs> cut and everything's fine. And I, I realized what power cinema had not just to make us like think and tell a story that kind of makes sense, but to like really uh, uh, connect to us emotionally. Yeah. And I respect that power so much. And I love the way that the horror genre, whether it's actually scary or it's just trying to tell a story about our anxieties. Uh, yeah. I love the way the horror genre can tap into something really primal and powerful. Yeah. And I think that makes it it's easily my favorite genre. If I have a favorite genre, it's the horror genre, as you might have okay. noticed. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and I think that's why, like, I think even bad horror movies often still have something to say or something to talk about or something mm -hmm. ambitious on their minds. And I mean, that's one of the reasons I got into film criticism too, is I was looking at a lot of these critics, some of whom very respected Siskel and Eber, for example, who would just not understand the horror genre sometimes. Right. Like they would get like the exorcist, or maybe they'd appreciate Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street 1, but then they would see Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and not get it. And I'm right. like, I, I, I remember thinking to myself, there is this big generational gap that sometimes yeah. happens in criticism. And the only thing that we can do in order to sort of change the conversation and get certain movies appreciated is to become part of that conversation. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go into film criticism was I wanted to stick up for movies that otherwise were being largely disregarded mm. and horror is a big, big one of those things. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I love the horror genre. I love, most horror movies, even bad ones. Uh, so yeah, it's what? it's my favorite. I dig it. That's a good yeah. answer, man. Uh, thank you, Alan Smithy, for that. Uh, let's see. Jay Scott Afriel says, "What's Bibb's take on the films of Ari Aster?" Had a hard time picking between Hereditary and Midsommar, but I think uh. I settle on Hereditary as the better film overall after rewatch. Are you familiar with Aster's short, "The Strange Thing About the Johnsons"? So first, which do, would you choose between uh, Midsommar, uh. Hereditary, and Are You Familiar with His Short? Uh, I, I am a little familiar with his short. I've actually interviewed him about oh. uh, all of his movies, including that short. Nice. Um, I think Ari Aster is an interesting filmmaker, mm -hmm. and I'm curious to see how he evolves because so far all of his movies tend to be about extreme emotional trauma mm -hmm. and then wrapping a familiar kind of genre uh, element around that. So. Yeah. For example, Midsommar, I think it's a really, really great film about trauma. I think it's a really great film about emotionally neglectful and abusive relationships. Yeah. But it, the one thing that kept me from like completely falling in love with it the first time was I've seen The Wicker Man already. Yeah, and, it, and it's got a lot of similarities. It owes a lot to that. And it's got a little bit of Texas Chainsaw in there as well. And right. I, I, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. But it just... I'm waiting to see if he evolves out of, I have all of these incredible performances, mm. these incredible, this incredible emotional content, brilliant cinematography, but I'm waiting to see if he has something distinctive to himself or if he's going to end up feeling like kind of a Brian De Palma, this incredible uh, genre filmmaker with an amazing sense of style and sometimes pulls out amazing performances, mm -hmm. but is perhaps a little too beholden to the past to ever truly break out and make everything seem new again. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are experiencing uh, Ari Aster's work and not necessarily knowing in, in great detail all of the things that he has emerged from, everything that yeah. led to Ari Aster. And I feel the same way about Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve and these really wonderful filmmakers who are in every respect the product of their influences. Yeah. And it bothers me sometimes that there there isn't enough attention being paid to where we got them from and like the films that and filmmakers that led us to them. But that doesn't make them less talented. I love Ari Aster's films so far. Uh, they're very, very dark. They're not always something I really want to revisit. And I, yeah. I think, I think Midsommar might be a slightly stronger film overall, but mm -hmm. I think Tony Collette's performance in Hereditary is God level and definitely yeah. should have not only been nominated for, but won an Academy award. Uh, so it's a real close call. Yeah. I agree with you. 
She's fantastic yeah. in that. Uh, okay. Jonathan Curdy says, if you two were on a team together, what would the name be? <laughs> Cowboy, Beast Bop, The Lord Sirs, or Beastie uh, Boys? <laughs> that's cute. Know. That's cute. I actually remember when Anarchy came out and I knew like I was going to get a random competitor. I actually yeah. came up with a list of like sort of like mashup names. <laughs> Like okay. I was like, if they like, it was me and John. I remember what I what I settled on it was like the top beasts. Oh, I like. Or maybe, that. or maybe the out beasts or something. I don't know the that beast was laws. Beast, beast laws, laws is okay. <laughs> uh, top beasts is probably a little strong. I like top beasts. Uh, uh, but top ten isn't your thing anymore. Right. And right. So right. now, uh, maybe the beast fathers. <laughs> oh, that's possible. I, <laughs> I like don't know. That. Yeah, I, I don't know. Actually, it's it's yeah. it's it. we 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 actually had a real hard time settling on the name for Shazam. Mm. Um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm actually struggling to remember some of the other ones that we came up with, but uh, yeah, we really wanted it to be positive. We wanted it to be strong, but also be kind of playful because yeah. Shazam isn't, you know, isn't like a real word, you know, right. in some respects. So um, that's kind of half the fun, I think, is coming up with a name together because you're deciding your personality, right? You're deciding what you want to live up to and who you want to be. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what was it like coming up with founding fathers? Was yeah, that, I mean, was that obvious that, or was that? That was my thing? decision. That yeah. was my, my suggestion rather. Uh, and I said to him, I was like, I mean, we're the, we're, we're, you know, what pissed people off was if we call ourselves the founding fathers. And I thought that was a great way to kind of needle people who had been in the game longer or had been yeah. in the game. But like we established in different ways uh, what the game is. And so yeah. uh, we felt that we could do Founding Fathers. It was cocky. It was a little cocky too. I like that. Uh, but And Dan, to his credit, was a little hesitant with it because he was like, ah, it feels like we're kind of, you know, saying it. I'm like, just just let it wash over you over the weekend. And Christian was all for it right off the bat. It was Dan who needed a little bit of time to kind of be okay with it. Uh, yeah. And then he came back and said, yeah, I like the idea. Uh, but we haven't, I mean, we haven't capitalized on it. And I, and I feel like that's my fault as the hustler in the group. I should have been like, we should have been making t-shirts. There should have yeah. been like t-shirts of us signing the independent, signing a declaration of the Schmodown or whatever. Yeah, like, good, yeah. yeah, there should have been. Somebody came up with t-shirts that had founding fathers and had all the names in that old school calligraphy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they put good. our names in there. That I thought you, should have, you should have one with you guys with powdered wigs. Or like, yeah, uh, exactly. You, know, you should have is you guys on Rushmore. Oh no! That's, there you go. Because two of them founding fathers are on that's Rushmore, true. man. That's true. It's a there you too, go. It's a little too I cocky, remember. Even I for me. Well, <laughs> it's but it's cocky though, and that's kind of what because we all know that you and Dan, you're legends of the game. You were there since basically the beginning. I don't think you're. Who was the first match? Was it like JTE and like Makuka or something? Yeah, yeah. It was those guys yeah. that were first. So technically, yeah, yeah, you were shows. first, first, but you were there from the beginning. Yeah. And of what the game is now, we were there. From yeah. The yes. No, no, absolutely. And I feel like. I remember when I first heard you were called the Founding Fathers, and I was like, are they heels? <laughs> because on one hand, you know, like the Purge movies were still coming out, and like those are yeah. the names of the bad guys. Oh, right. And I was like, okay, that's a thought. And then I was like, oh, like America's Founding Fathers. And I'm like, some of those guys were bad guys. <laughs> so, like, when we know what we, what we really, the way we're framing history now, you realize that, like, oh, right, that wasn't all great. Look, if Hamilton uh, could get a musical, right? we can call ourselves Founding Fathers. I no, no, you can totally call yourself <laughs> Founding Fathers. I, you know, take it back. But, like, yeah, yeah I, it was an interesting choice. And But you're the only team that could get away with that. Yeah, it's true. A uh, like thousand team. percent. The like, even, even if, like, JTE and Makuka teamed up and, like, we were there since the beginning, it's just like, yeah, but you're, we don't really look at you as fathers. Yeah, right. You know, and like, you, you are elder statesmen. <laughs> like we take very, very, and I don't mean that as an age joke. I know you make a lot right. of age jokes on SDN live. That's they not do. What I mean. We, we, we look to you as people who have been with us from the beginning. You've played, I think collectively you've played more matches than <sighs> anyone except maybe Makuga. Yeah. Like you've played a ton of matches. You've been yeah. there. You've been part of storylines from the beginning. You've mm -hmm. won multiple belts. Both of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a lot. Thing. Yeah. It's a lot of legacy to live up to. Dustin Dubuque says, outside of Whitney, what other film critics do you regard highly outside of your pod? I have been a longtime fan of Alonzo and Ooh. Dave. Um, 
Yeah, Alonzo and Dave, Alonzo Duralde, of course, played at the Schmodown. Yep. And Dave White, they have a wonderful cast called Lin- Linoleum Knife, uh, oh. where they're wonderful critics, and you should totally listen to them. There you go. Um, but there's a lot of critics that I, I really love and respect, and I'm worried I'm going to not think of a lot of them off the top of my head. But um, let's see here. Uh, Liz Shannon Miller, who's part yeah. of the Schmodown, she's a very, very good critic. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a critic I love. Uh, uh, her name is Jordan Searles, uh, okay. who is... Uh, incredibly insightful. Um, geez, let me think here. Um, Ingu Kang, who is a brilliant film critic, she's actually going to be writing the essay for the Criterion edition of Parasite. Wow. She's absolutely a genius. Mm-hmm. Um, Drew McQueenie is very insightful, True. obviously. Incredible. No one's arguing that. Um, the, and plenty of others besides. I don't want to insult yeah. anyone by coming up with a really long list and leaving someone out. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of really wonderful critics out there and yeah. uh, um oh, oh I was just about to remember somebody. Oh. There's so many there's so many good ones. Yeah, there are. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, Kristen Lopez, uh, we do a, a podcast together called Based on a True Podcast oh. where we talk about the way that Hollywood plays itself in movies. Um, and that's part of her Patreon, so you should check that out. Um, nice. She's really, really great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some people came up with names here. I like this. Beast Nation. I like that. That's fun. Beasts of No Nation. I like yeah. that. <laughs> Beast of A Nation is probably better. I don't Trans- know if I want to like <laughs> totally evoke that. <laughs> Transformers Beast Wars. Beast Wars I, is a fun one. I, I, I'm not out. I know you I'm like Transformers. Out. Yeah, like it works. Beast, Beast Wars is kind of fun. I like that. Grout Laws. Uh, <laughs> that's cute. That's cute. That's cute. The it's Beast Daddies is another one. Um, I don't know if I like that. Beast Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I don't know if that works. I think, that's, I think that's more of like I was with. I think if we, if the kid and I were playing you and we wanted to do a Western theme, we might yeah. do that. But I think it's, it's bad. Well, you can't. You spun away from yeah. Westerns. You made me mad. Oh, I know. I heard I made you mad. That's funny. Listen, when you when you're uh, when you're in a team, you go with the, what the team is most comfortable with. It's you know, true. like, and I think if we'd ended up on westerns, I think we would have done well. But we knew what else was on the wheel, yeah, and we just felt like it was worth a chance to try to find something we were a little stronger at. But then or Eastwood at the very came least for we you, felt and then Eastwood came for me, and we fought our way through it. <laughs> you did. We fought I was our way going through. crazy. Some, some of it we knew right off the top of our heads. A couple yep. of films we hadn't seen because the dude's been working in the industry for seventy years. Yeah, I know you're right. That's you're a right. long. That's a long, <laughs> long career. Yeah. I've been waiting for that Joe Kid question. Oh for yeah, three years I've been waiting yeah. for that Joe Kid question. I knew not watching Gran Torino would come back to bite me one of these days. Uh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I just never got around to it. What can you do? There's always a film you haven't seen. It's true. My girlfriend almost kicked me out of the, uh, out of the living room because I was screaming at him. I was like, <laughs> "No, it's the Korean War." Ah. Uh, uh, would Siskel and Ebert work if they were YouTube movie reviewers? Says Chris Taylor. That's an I interesting mean, question. Weren't they kind of YouTube movie reviewers? I mean, I mean because they sat, uh, you know, they, they set the template. Filmed. They set the template that I yeah. think most movie reviewers, uh, if, unless it's like a single person just talking to a camera, I think most movie reviewers who have a back and forth are yeah. following off of the template that Siskel and Ebert set. I think yeah. the real question here is if they debuted today. Mm. Would that still be exciting? Would no one else have done that before? Like I've put out a show where yeah. two critics who have a good rapport, don't agree on everything and are willing to fight each other when the time comes and be funny about it. Would that have happened without them? I'm not sure who, which other critics would have had that dynamic. And you'll notice yeah. that we never really replaced them with anything. Like we had that revolving cast initially yeah. after Eber, after uh, Cisco passed away. And then uh, it was um, Richard Roper. Richard Roper was the one who took yeah. it the whole time. And that was a perfectly good show, but the magic yeah. wasn't quite there. It wasn't exactly the same. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think we look at a lot of, I think it's, I think if they were podcasters, I think that's what we're looking at here. I think there's a lot of podcasts with a lot of different voices, yeah. people giving and taking. I, I hear like what happens on like the meaning of podcasts, for example. Mm-hmm. I really, really like those. So they did a, they did a podcast for uh uh, our critically acclaimed network a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Uh, we're doing a show called My Dinner with My Dinner with Andre. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're asking a variety of people, some of them yeah. critics, some of them not, to watch My Dinner with Andre or we watch it if they've seen it already and then just yeah. have a conversation about the film. And the film itself is a conversation that gets really meta. I love that uh, film. Yeah. Oh, you should you should come on and do it. I don't know. Let like, me know. Would, would you and Dan want to do that? I love Wallace Sean. 
I'll, I'll talk to you about it sometime. We'd love to okay. have you on. Just you and yeah. Dan, watch the movie, talk about it for an hour, talk about the That'd themes and your reactions. And it's interesting to see how different people are responding to the exact same film, especially when that film brings up so many different philosophical ideas about yeah. life and art. And uh, no one no one has approached it exactly the same way. And that's really that's exciting. Good. That's good. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really wonderful critics out there. And I think, yeah, I, I think if, if Ebert and Siskel were around today, and I wish they were, yeah. Um, not just because they'd be alive, but because I think there were great voices and criticism, even when I disagreed with them, uh, and I disagree with them a lot. Uh, but uh, I think they would do okay, but I think what's important is the template that they set for everyone else, and yeah. we're living in that world. I mean, I don't know if this show would exist without Siskel and Ebert. I don't know if people would assume that there was a market for it. I, I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. A thousand percent. Uh, Alex Frost says, I'm trying to break free from just watching geek movies all the time, oh. but I don't know where to start. What are some older movies that I should watch? Oh, well. Uh, uh, yeah, Cracker and Knuckles? That's yeah. Strange. Well, I mean, you've got here's, – here's the thing. Geek movies took over the industry, and yeah. they did so mostly within the last 20 years. You, you mm -hmm. go – like before Spider-Man, there was still a lot of variety, even at the summer box office. And yeah. um, the trick is I don't know what's old to everybody. You're right. You know, like you, you could be 20 and you could think that a movie, you could think that Home Alone is an old movie because it came out 30 years ago and it was long before you were born. Um, so I'm going to go old, old. And I'm going to okay. recommend like some old, old movies, movies that were old to me, movies that would be old even to my parents that okay. I think are still really vibrant and alive. And I think they're going to unlock some film history for you. And I think you're going to be really excited. So um, here, I'm going to recommend some really old movies. So the, the trio that comes to mind where you go back to like earlier days in cinema and they're so alive and exciting and they feel like they can be made today. Yeah. Watch Bride of Frankenstein, which is incredibly dynamically composed and full of awesome and subversive subtext. And mm -hmm. it's really funny as well. Uh, and then you're going to watch uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis on yeah. which pretty much every sci-fi story in cinema since has been based and it is a really immes uh, immersive and impressive production. It's a silent film, but I think unlike some silent films, which may be difficult for people who aren't used to them to watch, it's such a giant experience. It's such an enormous production that it's really, really exciting. And in particular, I think that movie has the best performance ever of someone playing a robot. Yeah. And because they're doing it for the very first time, movies didn't have robots before this movie. Yeah, yeah. And it's really incredible. And uh, and then finally, I'm going to recommend Lewis Milestone's All Quiet on the Western Front, mm. which if you've never seen it, I think it's the version, I think it's 1930, 1931. Yeah, it's an old film. Yeah. It is easily still the most potent anti-war movie I have ever seen. It is shot incredibly beautifully. Yeah. The, the performances are incredible. And you would think that because, oh, it's the 1930s, maybe you couldn't get like the horrors of war like you can in something like Saving Private Ryan or Black Hawk Down or whatever, it hits harder. Yeah, It's actually a really brutal motion picture. Um, so those would be three films maybe to start out with. Okay. If you want to go a little later, I would say Night of the Hunter is an incredibly creepy, dynamic, gorgeously produced yep. uh, movie that's kind of not like anything else. I just bought that on Criterion. Robert it's Mitchell. Amazing. It's a fantastic film. Sticks yep. with you forever. It's where forever. some of you who are young kids, you've seen uh, Do the Right Thing, where Radio Rahim is talking about that straight out of Night of the Hunter, he love and hate on the knuckles. He knew what he was doing. Like He yep. never yep. pretended he wasn't taking that from Night of the Hunter, but he right. literally just took that. Yep, from and put it in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I and I, and I agree with Babs. Uh, all, all those suggestions are fantastic yeah. suggestions. Uh, a little more, I would say, Citizen Kane, absolutely, because that is sure. still my my number one favorite film. Throw in On the Waterfront, just to kind of yeah. look at what method acting is like at that time in the fifties, and some of the um, uh, you know, the political issues that that the films can bring out and highlight as symbolism for what's going on in the real world. Uh, yep. Lawrence of Arabia, just to show you what the power of the medium of film can be and can engross you for almost four hours uh, watching this watching this guy's journey and also seeing the journey of a man who sees himself as some kind of young hero and as he actually goes to war, how it can change him and uh, almost damage him to the point of uh, unrecognizability to himself. I think that's one you can explore as well. Um, if you like that, make sure you see Bridge on the River Kwai because right. I think they're the same director also stars uh, Sir Alec Guinness. Yes. And, uh, I actually prefer that one, but they're both amazing. Yeah, fair. And then I, I would throw in 12 Angry Men. 
just to show you what, how a film can be contained in one space uh, and would you'd normally think it'd be boring, incredibly thrilling and exciting and give you something to think about as well. So yeah, definitely those. But I love All Quiet on the Western Front, man. That's such a great suggestion, brother. Uh, let's see if we got any more Streamlabs Super Chats before I bring people in. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. Patrick Harden, thank you for the nice donation, Patrick. I don't find most director cuts to be terribly different from the theatrical releases. Clive Barker's Nightbreed with an additional 20 minutes is an exception to that rule for me and makes a good movie great. What director's cut does that for you, Vince? Um, Nightbreed's an interesting choice. I grew up with the original, and that's actually still one of my very favorite films. Yeah, same. Um, I actually, there's things that I really like about the director's cut, but there's also things that I kind of prefer about the theatrical, which sounds mm -hmm. sacrilegious. Um, I'm trying to think about movies where the director's cut was such a big difference, and it's so hard not to default to Ridley Scott. Right, right. Ridley Scott, multiple times has happened to Ridley Scott. The original yep. theatrical version of Blade Runner is nowhere near as good a movie. Yeah, I agree. Any of the director's cuts, really. Kingdom of Heaven went from being a legitimately bad movie to like a three and a half star movie. With the okay, director. so you, so it, okay, so if you say it's all right, I'll watch. It. I've been hesitating because I'm okay. like, there's no way it's good. There's Here's no way I, he fixed it. He but did. You he did it, completely it, did. Okay. Here's the thing with this with that movie is all of the character work that justified the decisions made in the film, some yeah. of which are completely baffling when you're watching the theatrical cut are in the director's cut. They're all there. Okay. Like, it's just like, oh, all of a sudden, everything makes sense, and I care. Right. Like, it's just, it, it's still not his best movie, but, like, it goes from being a legitimately bad movie to a legitimately extremely good movie. Okay. And okay. so I would definitely say the director's cut is worth checking out. That's definitely one that I'm trying to think of, like, maybe some of the less obvious ones. I mean, Brazil is one of the more obvious ones. Yeah. I would throw Watchmen um, in there, whether Bibbs agrees. I, I don't know. I haven't but... seen the director's cut of Watchmen. Okay. I never it's got around it's a much better film than the original cut. I it's would more, hope so. It's more fleshed out. You understand the characters more. You understand why things yeah. and there's power and the emotional moments that are supposed to be powerful really do come forward uh in a in a uh, powerful way when uh you watch the uh, uh the director's cut of it um one the one you shouldn't watch is the cinema paradiso director's cut it absolutely destroys the movie for me interesting so don't ever watch that uh, uh cinema paradiso because <laughs> oh, uh, the director's cut of the warriors ruins that movie oh yeah don't they ever watch this the director's terrible, cut they had this terrible yeah. tales from the crypt framing device where it's like yeah. instead of just cutting from scene to scene and they like move to a different comic book panel. Oh, it ruins the, the pacing. It undermines the story. It's classic yeah. movie goes to like a two and a half star movie at best. It's exactly. Really exactly. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's let people know how they can come in live to ask questions. I see already a number of my patrons are in here waiting to ask questions. So let me bring my producer Sean Aberto in here. What's up, Sean? Uh, hey, Sean. You want to let people know how they can come in live and ask questions, my man? Yeah, sure, absolutely. But first, uh, just make sure you guys hit up hit the like button. Uh, it really helps out on the show. And if you're watching this uh, on repeat, please li also leave a comment. It does help with the alg algorithm of YouTube. So yep. if you guys could do that, it would be awesome. So as John just mentioned, um, if you're a patron of the Outlaw Nation, you've already gotten the link and you're ready in backstage already. If you're not a patron, I will be dropping the link in the chat as soon as I'm off screen. And then you can come in and join in live and ask William and John a question. So mm -hmm. pretty much how it's going to work when you click the link, it's going to bring you to StreamYards. And it, we please... Uh, Please have some headphones or a microphone. Uh, try not to, if you're watching and on at the same time, try to lower the volume so we don't get that echo kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, so John will be able, you'll be backstage. John will be able to see you. Um, and then when he brings you in live, you'll be on the show. So kind of just once you're in backstage, try to stay next to your computer because John, will, he can see you, but he wants to make sure that uh, you're there before he brings you in. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Always. Uh, always uh, can I just ask William? Yes, yeah, please. Of course. Yeah. What's up? Uh, so, Bibbs, I have a question. So, you're like you're kind of like the king of the entrances for the Schmodown. So, like a two part question: okay. What is the entrance that you are like most proud of? Like, if you like, I, if ah. I couldn't do any more, I'm glad I got to do that one. And yeah. is there an entrance <laughs> that you did that just like you knew in your head what you wanted the audience to kind of get from it, but it didn't quite hit the way you wanted? Sure. Uh, the the entrance I like the best, and. It's because it actually, it wasn't just a fun entrance, but it fulfilled an actual fantasy of mine, was my Mystery Science Theater 3000 entrance. Oh, that's, yeah. That was a very informative show for me, and I got to kind of be in the show for a couple of minutes, and they did a really wonderful job putting that together. That was not an easy ask. Yeah. And I asked them, like, is this too much? And they said no. 
And I'm like, okay, it just it seems like a lot, but they said, fine, we'll do it because it's like a title match. And I'm like, cool. And mm-hmm. that was just wonderful. And I love the way it came out. And it didn't take a lot of effort to like get the jokes timed right and everything. And um, I, some people said it went on too long. That was the joke. <laughs> yeah, um, I got it. Yeah. So that one was good. The one that. There's, there's two answers to the second one. Uh, the one that we did that just didn't quite come out the way I wanted it to was the clue entrance, which was almost perfect, but yeah. we didn't get the sound in the second half. Like, then the part where Brienne came out and she gave me her challenge and I didn't have yeah. to play the match. If we had had better sounds there, I think that one would have been perfect and it came this close to being exactly what I wanted, but yeah. Just, you know, technical snafu, you can't control it. Uh, mm-hmm. But the one that disappointed me the most was I really wanted to go out for my title match against Dan. And the problem with that match is we only, that that was a real rest job because the we decided who was going to play that match and then we had to play Dan, I think, in a week. Yeah. So I did not have a lot of time to put anything together. And I try not to plan entrances too far ahead yeah. because that feels like, I, I'm superstitious enough that that feels like jinxing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do, because at that time, we knew we were in the middle of a storyline where Whitney and I weren't going to be teammates for more than a few more weeks. Um, what I wanted to do was I wanted to recreate the opening of Siskel and Ebert. And it would be like Ooh. two of us, like because if you remember the opening of Siskel and Ebert, they're both mm-hmm. writing their reviews, mm-hmm. and then they mm-hmm. drop off their reviews, and they get in a cab, and they end up in a movie theater. We yeah. just didn't have the time to shoot it. Yeah, it would have it wouldn't oh. have been that hard, but we needed a few extra days because scheduling didn't work out, and so I ended up not having a good idea, and I ended up doing that Captain America gag from Spider Man Homecoming, which was okay. Yeah, it, it's definitely nowhere near the best I've ever done. Um, and it's just, I was never super happy with it because it was just a band aid on a bigger, more ambitious idea that just never came together. Yeah. It sucked. That's and a good idea it, about this. And, and I can't do that one again. It made sense for me and Whitney because we're podcast partners. We are right. doing the Siskel and Ebert format, but I can't, with the kid, it doesn't make sense. You know, yeah. like it, it would be fun, but it doesn't fit. So I, I, I that, the, that ship has sailed, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, and I'll tell you another one he didn't he didn't like is when I didn't participate when he tried to come at me when he when he won the belt with that singing thing. That's another one he didn't like either. I didn't want you to participate. I just wanted to surprise you. I was disappointed that I couldn't like. <laughs> it was supposed to be like a surprise birthday party Whoa. kind of thing. Yeah, that's what and then Bibbs was mad. Bibbs was mad because he's like, "Who told you? Who told you?" I know. I have yeah, theories. I'm not going to tell I have you who told you, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, listen, I was a little disappointed because I wanted it to be fun for you. I wanted, no, to, but I, I wanted I knew, it to be like but, I but wanted I it to be help like you. Up. Well, of course it would have been it would have been helped me because it would have made yeah. me feel good going into the match. But it was I supposed to be about it was supposed to be about us making up. Yeah. And because that you were kind of tipped off to it, and because I think you were mostly looking at it as oh, Bibbs is trying to get the psychological edge. Yes, on. I and I get that. I totally get that. And, yes. and I'm, I'd be lying if I said that like when I do my, my entrances that there isn't a part of it where I am trying to get a leg up on the match, but it's not so much about the players yeah. as it is about me. And it gives me something to focus on other than being anxious and nervous about the match. Yeah. So that one was a little disappointing just because I wanted it to be fun for you. And I don't think it was. And no, it wasn't that, fun. That, 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 that was disappointing to me. I didn't I want anything to, to do with that. I was like, I you're not going to let drag me into your shit. It wasn't about dragging you into it. It was about serenading you. Oh, yeah. And you just you just left, and it made me feel bad. Helping so, people, getting people yeah. who can actually sing, that would have helped. All right, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Tom Cruise. There you go. Like, oh, God. Classic singer from Top Gun. Yeah, I oh, saw wow. that. I, I just saw a little piece. I, I interviewed Melora Walters earlier oh. today, and uh, I was re-watching some of her scenes, and I forgot that Tom sings that Wise Up song in Magnolia, and I was like, ooh, he cannot sing. He is not no, a good he singer. Cannot. You Rock can't. of Ages is one of the most painful movies I've ever seen oh, in my life. No I, was, I was so unhappy watching that movie. I literally slapped myself in the theater because <laughs> I, that felt better than watching the movie. People wrote that into their reviews. Yeah. And it was so bad that someone slapped themselves. And I was like, that was me. <laughs> that, was me. that was literally me. I hated that movie. I hated that movie. All right, well, Sean. Thanks for stopping in, brother man. We're going to go live people. Are you sticking around or do you have to jump? I'm, I'm, got to, I'm got to jump. Okay, all right. Well, I'll stay for you, like another, a little bit more longer, though. Okay, sounds right. good, dude. All right, let's bring in some other people, Jay Scott. And please keep your stream live as the Super Chat's coming. Don't think because people are coming in live that uh, you don't have to send in stuff. Keep supporting the show. I uh, pr- would really appreciate it. It keeps the lights on in this place. Uh, all right, yeah. uh, Jay Scotty, for real, what do you got, man? Well, uh, Say hi to Bibbs. 
Hello. Good evening. Hi, Bibbs. Thanks for Hi. having me on. Good to see you. Yep. How's the attic? It's uh, it's pretty good. Uh, it's been a hot few days here, so it's been a little bit of an issue keeping it cool, but uh, feeling pretty good today. So. Feel the pain, brother. Feeling yeah. the pain. Well, I've got two fans on me right now. As I'm yeah. sure you're aware. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, I know, Bibiana, you're, you typically, you kind of make your bread and butter speaking more to um, indie indie films, art house films, not saying you don't cover the big blockbuster stuff, but I did want to ask your your take on the whole um, Snyder Cut thing, uh, that coming to fruition. Oh, uh, here we uh, go. Obviously, it's nice to see for Zack Snyder, but do you think it sets a dangerous precedent? Is it um, you know, some issues of fan entitlement as well as rewarding petulant behavior? That's kind of my right. fear. What do you think I about it? That's a great question, actually, and you know that's the kind of movie where I uh, I didn't think it would happen, just because. And I think honestly, if COVID hadn't happened, we might not have seen it because uh, it's it's a lot of money to finish a film, oh, yeah. uh, and to completely redo a film that didn't make a lot of money, and it probably didn't seem like a smart play mm -hmm. for the studio to invest even thirty million more dollars in that. Um, however, with, you know, sort of a lack of, uh, not only a lack of new content, but also a lack of new sort of announcements to get excited about, it does make perfect sense for Warner Brothers to make that movie. I love seeing director's cuts. I love seeing director's cuts in movies that I hate. I love seeing director's cuts in movies that I love and don't think mm. can be fixed. Um, I think it's fascinating to see what different filmmakers wanted. And I was actually one of the few critics who didn't hate Joss Whedon's Justice League. It's, it's messy. It, it is, is messy. Frank it's a Frankenstein monster, but yeah. the point of Frankenstein isn't that the monster was unworthy of love. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that I really like in that movie, specifically like character moments and the specific actors in it. The plot is bad, but the character bit was actually pretty strong. So I'm very curious to see what Zack Snyder could do for it. And I think the issue that I have with the story that the Snyder Cut became isn't that fans rallied behind something they really wanted to see and showed their support long enough, consistently enough, and in involved the filmmakers in the process of showing their support for this and then eventually getting the thing that they wanted. That's fine. That's how it's supposed to work. Studios are supposed to give us the stuff that we want to see. Yep. What bothered me was that, especially the initial wave, where the people who genuinely wanted, in a very positive, earnest way, Zack Snyder to have an opportunity to finish his movie. You know, right. whether you loved or hated Batman v Superman, I thought it was really, really bad. I liked Man yeah. of Steel. I didn't like Batman v Superman. I'm really hot and cold on Snyder's films in general, but I support him getting his own version of that movie out there. Yeah. But there was a lot early on. There was a lot of negativity. There was a lot of ugliness. There was a lot of bullying. There yeah. was a lot of people I know personally who were treated exceptionally badly in the online space by people who are fans of specifically Zack Snyder's films. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very, very difficult to want those people to succeed when they have been so cruel. However, they're, hopefully they're only a small fraction of the people who supported this. Yeah. So overall, I support the idea of seeing the cut. What I do hope is that this doesn't seem to be um, – a justification for future bullying. And I know that this has led people to say like, oh, let's see uh, uh, David Ayer's original cut of Suicide Squad. And I wonder if there's a way to rescue uh, Joel Schumacher's longer cut of Batman Forever. And I want to see those too. But what would really make me happy is if all of the people who said, we believe in a creator's rights, we want to see Zack Snyder's original vision for Justice League, if they could support seeing, if they could support that, if they could support a studio going back to a director and saying, finish your film, do it the way you want. If they could do that for a film that didn't have Batman in it. Mm. Because okay. that's what seems to be weird to me is that they only seem to want to take Batman movies and make them darker. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's it. I want Justice League, but I want it to be darker. I want Suicide Squad, but I want it to be darker. I mm -hmm. want Batman Forever, but I want it to be darker. What about, and I'm just throwing something out here randomly. What about Billy Bob Thornton's three hour cut of all the pretty horses, which yeah. everyone who saw it said it's supposed to be one of the best movies I would ever love made. that cut. Yeah. It's supposed to be one of the best movies nobody has ever seen. Yeah, yeah. But they they just no one no there's no support for that. There's only support for stuff with mm -hmm. Batman in it. That hurts my soul a little bit. Well, I mean, it's a social look. I I don't a hundred percent agree with uh, with uh, what Bibbs is saying because I do I did want this cut uh, to come out. Uh, I think what I'd said on other shows was I don't see it happening because 
that particular WB executive regime in no way, shape, or form was going to release a Snyder's uh, a Snyder cut of Justice League because that would have left too much egg on their face if it actually was good and people yeah. loved it way more. It wasn't until it wasn't until the regime change and it wasn't until uh, COVID, as Bibbs pointed out. And the streaming service, which Deborah Snyder pointed out, HBO Max coming through uh, for for it to make it possible. So the fans who are saying we knew it, we pushed, we made it happen, yes and no. That you you yeah. did. There was a impetus, and certainly Emmerich came out and said that listening to the fans was a part of this. However, if all these other factors don't happen, there's no way you're seeing the Justice League. Uh, uh, Zack Snyder Justin, no matter how much you crow about it or write people or some yeah. small section of them bullied some of the critics. By the same token, though, I do want to push back a little. Some critics, Bibbs, and you know I'm not wrong on this, some critics kind of get off on fucking with the fans and condescending to the fans and thinking they're better than the fans and yep. speaking down to the fans. And yep. those critics need to get their asses called out as much as the fans I get called out. I think those critics need to get called out, too. And I've seen that in our space from some people we know. And yeah, that sure, frustrates me. I agree. I think there is a definite, uh, I think it's true for any industry. Mm. There are some people in it who are maybe, you know, coming at it from a, from a negative angle, people who maybe even aren't even good at it. I'm not going to name any names, yeah. but um, <laughs> I think I'm not, because I honestly can't even think offhand of like who okay. I'm talking about, but like, not there worth are, our time, obviously. It's not yeah. worth our time, but like, listen, there are different critics. There's a reason we don't just have one film critic and they yeah. just say everything is good. We need all kinds of different voices. And sometimes, um, and sometimes the relationship between fans slash readers or listeners and critics can go back and forth and we can kind of push each other into negative places. Yes. And, it, and, and it's easy to fall into a trap because we're only human. We're emotional people. Yeah. And if someone pushes us real, real far and they won't just let something drop, then, you know, sometimes people get angry and, mm -hmm. That sucks, and it's. I think it behooves a critic if you're trying to be a voice of reason, sanity, earnestness in this industry. I think it, we have to try to be above that as much as we can. But we have also seen people just be unfairly trolled yeah. or worse. Yes, and that's I'm not going to never going to deny that. But yeah, and I definitely yeah, didn't mean both to say, ways. I yeah, and I definitely ways. didn't mean to say that critics are perfect. No one's saying critics are perfect. Right. We've right. all we've all seen it. We've all given a review that. Like, you know, just like, eh, maybe it was a little hard on it that day, or maybe I was too kind. I was way too kind on the Lion King remake in my written review. Oof, yeah. Like, I was way, I was giving it a lot of passes for its technology, right. but like a couple of days later, I was like, no, it just completely sucks, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's just yeah. a bad movie that looks neat. Like, that's yeah. it. So we're all fallible. We're all, we're all human and we're all doing the best we can. And sometimes we need to do better. I think, yeah, and I think that's the thing at the end of the day. As much as the fans need to kind of curtail some of that behavior, and absolutely they do, especially when they get into the misogyny or yes. sexual assault, act, like uh, oh, uh, threats, horrifying. or or the kind of racism that you'll see sometimes come through as well, or yeah, as I said, sexism, anything like that. Those fans need to stop doing that crap, absolutely, right. because no fake movie about fake characters written about fake shit should cause people to say actually violent things or lob actual violent threats at people about it because that's taking something yeah. way too far i love movies as much as anybody on this planet i love yeah. diving in and, and losing myself in a movie when i'm in viscerally when i'm in the theater that being said when i leave the fucking theater batman isn't someone i actually know uh, yeah. or superman is someone that i actually know so if you go after them i'm actually going to threaten your life that's where it's gone too far i, I and think but okay. i think the issue is i think a lot of times especially when it comes to these kind of geeky properties yeah there are a lot of people who are not just liking a movie or disliking a movie they're defining themselves by their appreciation yes. of something yes. and so when you say i don't like this batman movie what a yeah. person can hear is, well, I like this Batman movie. Liking Batman is an important part of who I am, and it becomes across like a personal attack. Yeah, and it comes result, like, you don't like this movie, like you don't like attack. me. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. And that's and that's something that I think we as critics and, and pundits in the industry, whether you consider yourself a critic or not, have yeah. a responsibility to pull way back from because we let that go way too far. Yeah. We let that go like, oh, I don't like I, I love Star Wars and therefore if Star Wars does something I don't like. I think I, I'm entitled to all of these to say all of these horrible things. And I'm like, right. scale it way back. I don't care how much you like it. It is a movie. Right. Right. And maybe and you'll decide that you like it later. Maybe you won't like it, whatever. Right. It doesn't 
mat- matter yeah. that much. And, and by the remotely. and by the same token, if you get into the film business to be uh, uh, masturbating your brain because you think you know better than other people and you condescend to the fans and condescend to the people who read your shit. I think you deserve all kinds of uh, uh, vitriol, not that kind, not to that level, but I certainly think you deserve to get put in your place. Uh, mm-hmm. And that kind of stuff needs to stop as well. So, and that's a minority of critics, just like it's a minority yeah. of fans who are doing the crazy shit. It's the minority of critics who are coming off as condescending or better than uh, and thinking they know better than. And those people need to get their asses called out as well. So and it goes both ways. But what's does. the common? What's the common thing? Human beings, and that's yeah. unfortunately no matter where you're at, you're going to encounter that kind of shit. Uh, thank you, uh, Jay Scott. I appreciate that question, yeah. brother. Yeah, really definitely. Question. I appreciate the insightful perspective, guys. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, can yeah. I throw one more in there that's a little more lighthearted? Uh, make it quick, man, because we got four people waiting on us and we're running out of time. If, if the wheel slice was a slice of food, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> it would be a fruitcake. It would be full of nuts, it would be full of dried fruit, and everyone would spin away from it every single time. We're just, no! I like it. I like you're it. Saying <laughs> if a, if you're saying if the wheel was it or a wheel slice? Is that what you're saying? Or if the wheel itself? The wheel itself or a particular okay. slice. To me, I'd say a sliced apple pie. To me, the wheel itself is cheesecake. I know it's going to taste good, but I'm going to hate myself in the fucking morning. That's for <laughs> I'm sure. not going to hate myself. I'm just going to eat the whole <laughs> wheel. Love it. Good stuff. Good Thanks, stuff. Chase. Thanks, Scott. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, so awesome. All right, let's bring on Chris here. He's uh, coming in from Scotland. What's hey, up, Chris? Chris? How are you? Hey, guys. Not bad. Hi. Yeah, sorry. This is going to sound weird because this is going to be kind of a continuation from the last one because I didn't. I had a question and now it's changed. Okay. Okay, let's do it. So when you're, you're talking about taking ownership of movies, hmm. I think that happens a lot, not just in superhero movies, in horror as well. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Sure. I think that's fair. I think in particular in horror remakes mm-hmm. that particularly comes off a lot stronger. So obviously Bibbs, you're more of a horror fan than John is. You know what? So I, I resent that. <laughs> <All> right, <laughs> I found my place to say. Just because I'm not watching <laughs> Friday the thirteenth part forty five does not make me less of a horror film. But go ahead. Oh, like we got to forty five. I wish we got to forty five. But, but I was gonna ask, so in the essence of horror, do you think there's any remakes in particular that actually maybe are better sure, or do more justice to the original or imp- maybe add a new aspect to the, that movie that makes them better? They're unfairly maligned just because they're remakes. Does I, that make sense? I, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that there is uh, – uh, I think there's often a misunderstanding about what we can or should expect from a remake. Yeah. Because I think that there's often this idea that if a remake isn't better than the original, it wasn't worth making. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Yeah. What I'm looking for from a remake is a reason for it to be remade. Hmm. And that thing could just be we have a new perspective, we have a new idea, we have more money now, and we can do it maybe kind of cooler. Or yeah. um, it, There's a million different reasons why you can do a remake, and it's not necessarily to surpass the original. Hopefully, if you're remaking something, you're remaking it because you have affection for the original and you just want to show your perspective in a different way. A really great example of this would be Luca Guadagnino's uh, Suspiria remake, yeah, which is Ooh. incredibly different from Dario Argento's. And Dario Argento's, I would argue, should belong on the top ten list of, ever, of horror movies ever made. Wow. But yep. Guadagnino's remake is takes the basic germ of the idea – and goes in completely different directions. It's still ambitious visually, but it looks nothing like the original. Mm. It actually looks at, you know, instead of making it look from the outsider perspective of, oh no, there's a ballet school run by witches, it's like, what would a ballet school run by witches look like from the inside? Right. And then he was he argued that, okay, so what that is, is an isolationist society that is run by people who are perhaps uh, uh, tending towards wickedness, and then he found a distinct metaphor for that mm-hmm. in uh, Cold War uh, Germany. So he took all of these extra weird layers and he threw them into Suspiria and the movie works. Do, yeah. do I prefer the original? Kind of. But I love that that remake exists because that is a fascinating take mm-hmm. on the exact same thing. But then again, you have something like, uh, I think it was Chuck Russell who remade The Blob in 1988. Right. The original The Blob yeah. with Steve McQueen is wonderful. Yep. It really plays really well today. Like, it's very, very strong. The visual effects are pretty good. But in the 80s, now that we have 
our ratings and we have more complicated practical effects, they could turn the idea of a big space amoeba that it dissolves you into something <laughs> truly gruesome and yeah. amazing. And they did yeah. a really wonderful job. And I would argue that that's at least as good as the original, but very, very different. And then you have something like... Um, Look at the two Black Christmas remakes, yeah. which are both interesting films. So the original Black Christmas is one of the first films that could like plausibly call itself a slasher. Mm -hmm. um, it follows a lot of the rules of the slasher genre. But on top of that, it's a story about young women on a college campus. It's a story about a woman who is has decided that she wants to have an abortion and the yeah. boyfriend who doesn't want her to and tries to control her. And in the end, the movie argues that his desire to control her is indistinguishable from uh, uh, a serial killer who just wants to kill women. Yeah. And that's a bold statement, but it's it's kind of tucked away. The first Black Christmas remake, Black Xmas, is just the schlocky slasher version of that. That's the Mary not, Elizabeth Winstead one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and it's very watchable. It's 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 sloppy, yeah. and you can tell it was like reworked a lot in the editing room. But it's very watchable, and I, I enjoy watching it. It's nowhere near as good as the original, but it's fun that it exists. Yeah. And then you look at the most recent version, which actually took all of the subtext from the original and said, you know what? All of that subtext from the original is stuff that we are talking about openly right now. Mm -hmm. Young people are talking openly about the politics that a movie like Black Christmas touched upon. So let's yeah. set it at a college campus with a bunch of politically minded young people and actually follow that in its logical direction. And yeah. I think that movie got, un it, it's, it's not amazing. Yeah. I think it falls apart a little bit at the end and I think there's some stuff that doesn't work, but I actually love the personality of that film. I love, yeah. uh, uh, it, it feels very real for right now. And I think it's one of those movies we're going to look back at and say, people were way too hard on that. People yeah. really weren't willing to give that movie a chance. And it's at least way more interesting than we gave it credit for. I, I think there's a director's cut of that version that's much better. And the problem Probably. I had, William, is that everything was way too on the nose. You know, we get it. You're movie. talking about gender politics. We yeah. get it. You're talking it's a about men or men. Yeah, but I think they're there's allowed a way to be direct. To... Sure, they're allowed to be, but they can also <laughs> yeah. be artful. And what I wanted is something of an artful remake that ha mm -hmm. that had something more complex and eloquent to say. And I interviewed April for this, and I and I couldn't like 100 percent go forward and, and, and say what I felt, but I know that I felt that it was a little too easily presented and i would have liked a little more time with the characters to flesh this whole situation out of the patriarchy of the gender politics as I said the racism all of that is there i just want a little more time to be fleshed out and invest in these relationships a bit more so that when those moments happen i feel the weight of what the of what's happening in the in the in those emotional changes and beats that occur and the surprises and twists and turns of the film the empowerment thing is great i love yeah. that the ladies were willing to fight back that was great I wanted something a just a little more behind it that would have right. made it even more powerful for me. That's my two, only thing. Two things about what you said. One, I agree with you that parts <laughs> of the film were underdeveloped. That movie was very, very rushed. It was announced. Yes, it was. Yeah, they both released. said that. That's yeah. not a lot of time to put any yeah. movie together from you're start right. to finish. So I'm a little forgiving of that in the horror genre, but you're right. It's a, it's a little underdeveloped. No one could argue that. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that you said I think is interesting is uh, it's, it's not what you wanted from the movie. And I actually think that that's something that as a critic, it's my responsibility yeah. not to want anything from the movie and to just see what the movie is. That's fair. Well, whatever let the me... movie is, I, I have to judge whether it did that well. That's fair, so but let me connect the back. It to be, yeah. Let me connect it back to your earlier point, which was yeah. if you're going to make a remake, have something to say. And that's what I'm saying to you. Yeah. I felt like it, it, if you're going to remake it for a second time, yep. then if what you, you've got to come at it and present it in a way that's just as good as the original, if not better, or else what you have to say isn't going to match up, isn't going to hit that level. And so what's the point of me watching? I'll just go watch the original. So okay, that's well, what I mean. Point, I don't mean what's that the I point of watching. Let me get to this. What's the point? And this is a different thing because they yeah. did rewrite it. But what's the point of watching a new stage production of Hamlet if you've seen another stage production of Hamlet? On some level, you're watching people riff on something similar. Absolutely. I don't think it's inherently a bad thing. I, I would argue that, again, there are parts of the movie that are underdeveloped. But I think by the end of that movie, they do put their own stamp on it and they do take it in a very distinct direction. Mm -hmm. Whether it's better than the original or as good as the original, we can have that conversation. But I don't right. think that, that that's necessary the most horrible thing for a remake. I think it's just a matter of they tried to do yeah, something significant. And yeah, it's saying. not an all-time classic, 
but I do think it's more interesting than I got credit for. Okay, fair. And I respect that. We'll yeah. disagree on that, but I respect it. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate <laughs> okay, it. Uh, well, oh, yeah. what, I was, what I was going to bring up was the Evil Dead remake, I feel is a very unfairly maligned. The I one agree. with. Um, I, I like that. What's her, what's her face? Yeah. Okay. Jane Levy. Jane yeah. Levy, yes. Jane Levy, yeah. yeah. Thought yeah, that that's was a, a really good remake. That's a fantastic remake where they just uh, they they found a slightly different way to get into the storyline, and then Fede Alvarez understood that the original film, what made it so awesome, really was its absolute daring in its visual style, mm -hmm. and he just doubled down on that. And yeah. what's really cool is that there, even though Sam Raimi's style was very influential for a short period of time, people don't make movies like he used to anymore. So even yeah. though it was very beholden to the original, it still felt fresh. So yeah. I love that remake. That's a great remake. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Hey, hey, drop me off because I'll start a whole fire here for some. I know you will. I know. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, appreciate that. All right, please only have one question, guys. We got enough street yeah. labs and super tests to get through. We got limited time, so uh, all right, Tushka, Chris, what's up, dude? How you doing? Good. Hey, hey what's going on, fellas? Hey, Vince, John, how we doing? Good. Man, y'all, y'all are taking us to church right now. I'm telling you. <laughs> but uh, hey, John, I got one, two. Three, four, five. Five questions. questions. That's right. Let's go. Five. Right. I, I, I was gonna stop at four, but that's too much, right? No, no, no. Hey, um, hey, awesome stuff though, for real. Um, yeah, yeah just like Chris. I mean, I had a question kind of already formulated, and then, uh, you know, you all got us kind of like really kind of going down a certain path and thought process. Well, whatever your uh, question is, ask it, man. Yeah. yeah so, um, with everything that we're kind of getting, because uh, I mean, at this point, we're pretty much getting inundated with uh, movies. Or just content in general. You got Quibi, where it's like your little bite size. Uh, you got all the streaming services. You got the films. Right. Uh, what would you all personally rather have? Would you rather have uh, maybe some of your favorite films kind of remade or kind of maybe give, given a little bit of justice to kind of get that love again? Because it's hard to dig deep into that, you know, 1960s pile. Uh, or do you want to see just a lot more original content and just more push towards the new and not necessarily forget the old, but like, Maybe not just keep dragging it along. Okay, I don't think those are our only two options, but let's let's go with <laughs> well, those. No, no, but let's but let's go with. I just want to make yeah. it clear because I'm not like coming down. I actually think, ideally, I what I would want is somewhere in the middle there. I think we should yeah, always make right. new stuff. I think that's absolutely important. I know yeah. people say that like, oh, there are no new ideas in Hollywood. Uh, one of the first weird. movies ever made was a remake. Okay, remakes have been around since the Great Train Robbery. True, and that was the first like narrative feature that not even narrative feature, just the first narrative film that we had. Yeah. Immediately remade a year later. Remakes are nothing new. Reboots are nothing new. That's not inherently a problem, but we do need to keep moving forward. We do need to have stories that reflect the now, that reflect modern uh, uh, ideas, concerns, anxieties, sensibilities, uh, and we will always need new stuff. So keep on bringing out the new stuff. What concerns me is that a lot of these streaming services, and some are better than others. Like I'm impressed with how many old movies are on like HBO yeah. Max, for example. Yeah. Um, but uh, a lot of these streaming services are putting so much emphasis on the new that a lot of the older stuff is just not presented in a way that it is being introduced in a fun, positive, encouraging way to newer audiences. And what I would like to see more than anything else is for services like Netflix or Peacock or whatever, whatever service you got to have more curated content and have mm -hmm. actual like Turner classic movies hosts talking about movies. I mean, I'm talking about like, just like from the nineties backward yeah. and just yeah. making sure that when you see that here's this movie on Netflix and you haven't seen it, maybe you've heard of it, but you don't necessarily know why you should give a crap. Right. There needs to be something in there to just sort of guide you along and say, hey, this movie is awesome. Let me tell you why this movie is awesome. Let me tell you why this movie is directly responsible for this other movie that you love. And how if you work backwards through history, you can find out a whole bunch of cool stuff that m makes the stuff you currently love even better. Yeah. So that's what I would like more of is I would like these streaming services to take better care – of their older content to make that older content more accessible in a variety of ways from simply being able to click on it more easily to being able to introduce it to young people who might be very eager to skip it. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't talk about clue. That's the only one you don't want to talk about. But like, here's the thing that I would say, Chris, here's the thing that I would say. I thoroughly agree with what Pip just said as he's speaking about it. I was like, that's a great idea to have, have to hire hosts. Lord knows we're all sitting around wanting to do something. Hire hosts to, yeah, to curate these things because I, I reject your premise that we're dragging the old stuff along. 
I think what's happened well, is these people have come along to become film fans over the last 20 years and think they don't need to go back. Or like Makuga, I don't like any film that's been black and white. That kind uh, of lazy ass thinking drives me nuts about get people. Kicked claim, out of the showdown for that. There you go. People claim to be cinephiles, and nothing against Makuga. He's not. He's never claimed to be he's that. Lovely. But I mean, people yeah. like that who who want to get into film rather and don't want to go back and revisit the foundations of film and get joy out of that are the mm -hmm. same people who go, "Oh, this is such a new and interesting concept." And those of us who've watched films for numerous decades go, "No, that's a concept from the 1940s, mm -hmm. guy or girl. Mm -hmm. Get over there and." And, and educate yourself too much of the TikTok generation wants everything to just be right in front of them and not do the work there is a work there is something there's a joy in becoming a cinephile because you do the work and discover these great films and actors and you find out why these are considered classics and too many people just want to accept whatever's in front of them and not do the extra work and put in the extra time and that's going to make the difference with you being before between you being a knowledgeable film pundit or critic or reviewer, whatever you want to call yourself, and being just another voice in the sphere. I always think I that's the difference. You know? I agree. I think it is behoove I think it's on people yeah. like us. Yes. For what, whatever, whatever little acclaimed celebrity awareness that we have, we are people who are trying to, to make it our business yeah. to introduce people and talk about cinema. And when so much of what we are asked to do is to just talk about more Marvel movies, is to just talk about right. more... And listen, I like them too. That's not a problem yeah. but it is our responsibility a solemn responsibility yeah. i think to also use that platform to make sure that people know about the older movies to understand yeah. why those older movies are exciting to make the time for those movies and i we try to do this on the critically acclaimed network we have multiple shows that are dedicated to movies of the past and showing why they're significant now and yeah. it really bothers me i don't it doesn't bother me when someone who isn't a film critic or pundit or professional uh, doesn't know about older movies, but it bothers right. me when those critics, pundits, professionals aren't excited to introduce people to those movies, yeah, to talk yeah. about those movies, and especially when they don't want to learn. Yep. I don't care who you are, whether it's me, John, Dan Merle, doesn't matter. We all have gaps in our film knowledge because we were born when we were born and we have a lot of catching up to do. Absolutely. All right? We have to be excited about the discovery, not just of the new, but also of the past. And yep. that's where I think the best parts of film fandom comes together because you are constantly learning new things about where we've come from and where we're going. Yeah, nothing makes me happier than stumbling upon a, T a film on TCM that yeah. I've never seen. or Because people forget 1931 has like 75 great films. Oh, Only yeah. people are talking about the classic ones. Every year in film, there are anywhere from 20 to 50 to 70 films that are good. It's only the classics or the great ones that people talk about or remember. And that goes all the way back to the history of film. But too many people forget because they just want to focus on the classics. There are and great hidden gems in every year agreed. of film. And yeah. And sometimes it falls to uh, – sometimes it's fans. Sometimes it's critics who are, of course, yeah. also fans, but they have a different position. And uh, it, it sometimes falls to us to rescue those films – from obscurity. Yeah. And when you think about a lot of the films that are considered classics yeah. now were not considered classics when they came out. It took exactly. about 40, no, about 30, 35 years for It's a Wonderful Life to yep. finally be canonized as a classic. And you know what did it? You know what saved it from obscurity? Was the remake. Yeah. They Terrible remade remake. It's a Wonderful Life with Marlo Thomas and Orson Welles. It's yeah. actually not quite as bad as I think its reputation is, <laughs> but it's nowhere near as good as the original. But it raised awareness of the film, and all yeah, of a sudden really. the original had value now, and people brought it back. Yeah. So when we set, when we remake something, we also kind of celebrate the past, and it gives us an opportunity to talk about the past, and mm -hmm. it unlocks the past. There you go. Awesome. All right. And what, yeah, and that's what I meant by like dragging, not necessarily yep. like we we should drop it, but it's just yeah. Sometimes we just keep like rehashing. And just yeah. not making it better, but I, man, I love that. I love that bibs because I, it's a wonderful life. is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, um, yeah. I could I could turn that on and watch Same. it anytime. Jimmy Stewart. Absolutely. But Absolutely. hey, Absolutely. thank you guys, bibs. Congrats thank you. on the win. Thank you. Uh, let's go, Corky Cork and Mercs, man. Let's uh, climb that yeah. ladder. And uh, I look forward to John. I look forward to you joining next year, man. You'll be the dare you, man. In the dare you. Mercs. Oh, you are dare welcome you. with the Mercs, John. You are There's welcome. There's no room. They're not going to take me. There's no room. There is, you'll, be the, you'll be the straight man. You'll be the straight man. Yeah. Like, straight man. Yeah. Oh. You'd be hilarious with us, man. Can you imagine what the whole time going, what am I doing on this thing? Exactly. All right. <laughs> so great.
Thank you. See you, brother. I love him. All right, let's bring on director Alan Smithy, legendary director Alan Smithy has joined us. I love us, your uh... and Hellraiser bloodlines. Thank you, Bibbs. Your yeah, microphone. Also... Wait, am I? There you go. You're good. You're good. I'm also directing such classics as The Shrimp on the Barbie starring Cheech Marin. That's I like a good that movie. movie too. I like that you movie. Know, in discussing old movies, not as old as some of the ones you were discussing, but a black and white classic that I love is the movie Seconds with uh, Rock yeah. Hudson. And I've never oh, seen yeah. another movie that's gone to a similar plot line or idea. It's totally unique. So everyone out at home, watch that movie. Amazing motion picture, yes. Oh, yes, I yeah. love that. Yeah. And since we're pressed for time, I do have a pertinent question ready to go here. Okay. Bibbs, have you heard of the young man called Chandru? I have. I, I know Chandru Dandapani very well. He's a very nice man. <laughs> well, there's this question out there. He's the not a very nice man. Stop it. As to, exactly. The the question as to whether Chandru is a wonderfully lovable nerd or <laughs> secretly a passive aggressive D bag. So. <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> I think he's a wonderful nerd, and I yeah. love I love Smets too. But the mm. jock got beaten by the nerd, and it's mm. pissing off the other jocks, and that's what I think is going on. What do you think? Wow, I think that's an interesting perspective, <laughs> and it's interesting because it's fair because that is how they nice present way. themselves. Like Kevin Smith has. Uh, not Kevin Smith, Kevin Smets. Yeah. <laughs> They're both geeks. But uh, Kevin Smets came out there with this big, rocky kind of mentality mm -hmm. where he was coming on like Clubber Lang as this incredibly talented individual who just never had their title shot and it wasn't fair. And he fought his way to the top and then he couldn't retain it in his first title bout. He li maybe lived up to it a little too closely. But no one really has retained that belt other than Hector and Jason. That was at the beginning. But anyway, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, but you, fair enough. But my point is, is that um, he, he first off, Smets is amazing, and I love Smets as a person and oh, as yeah. a player. I also love Chandru as a person and as a mm -hmm. player, and I think he's an interesting player in that he has – some people jump onto the scene well-defined. Yes. So I, think, I think Roka is one of those. He knew exactly what he was doing right from the beginning. And, yeah, the character has evolved a little bit, gone sure. from heel to, to face, whatever. But he's basically always been the outlaw. Mm -hmm. And some of us find our character a little bit more over time. And what I think is interesting about Chandru is that he's gone from incredibly lovable, sweet, nice young man to someone who is maybe like out. I, I, when I look about the character, like he was playing in the title match, I was thinking not so much of a bad guy. I was thinking of the movie hackers mm. and how here's, here are some people who are super smart, super nerdy, but mm. they are going to fight for what they want. They're going to take every scrap that they can get and they're going to use everything to their advantage. And they're going to use their nerdiness. They're going to use mm -hmm. just every detail that they know in order to get the upper hand. It is a competition. You do what you can in order to win it. And yeah, over the course of that match, he didn't come across as the nicest guy ever, but he was doing that in order to be Smets. Now, I yeah. think that sometimes people go too far about that. I actually don't like it when people, it's once everyone uses challenges because sometimes you think the question is wrong or it's out of context mm -hmm. or something. There are perfectly valid challenges out there, but sometimes you see people use challenges not because they're challenging the question, but because they're challenging the game and they're trying to warp the game. To How dare you? How dare it's, you? It's happened. It's How happened. dare you, sir or lord? How dare you accuse yeah, other people I mean, of using those challenges. challenges? I maintain. I maintain that I had precedent. How dare you? I had precedent for that because in the free for all, <laughs> in the previous free for all, it was established that if you add extraneous information to an answer and that extraneous information is not correct, then mm -hmm. the answer is invalid. That mm -hmm. showed that was precedent. However, it wasn't so much that it was like an extraneous challenge. It was. I was wrong. I was off by a month. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, he was he was he received his lorddom one month after Jurassic Park came out, right. and but I you think you couldn't let it go. You could you knew he knew the right answer. I so knew he knew the right answer. Trying to get an angle there. to get you know, a point. Wait, they well, knighted that guy I, for uh, Jurassic Park. He got a knighthood for the dinosaur movie. Wow, that's pretty cool. Well, he got a lorddom for the for the dinosaur. We'd already been a <laughs> oh, sir. That, that was okay. my point. Here's the here's here's because I, I remember when he died and I had to like write up an obituary and I, I, someone was like, "Oh, he's Sir Lord Attenborough." I had to correct them. No, he's Lord. Mm -hmm. So that was actually really important. He earned that. If you called him something wrong, I thought that that invalidated the question, and I actually thought that yeah, of course he knows who it was, mm -hmm. but he presented it in such a way that the answer became wrong. Now. I, I lost that challenge, but and that's fair. 
I'm not going to fight it. I wasn't trying to manipulate the game. I thought he legitimately gave the wrong answer. It's kind of like when Perry wrote down in a long time ago, not Gear. Or was it no? Because I'm a five. It was a not Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. When the answer was Guillermo del Toro, <laughs> just because she wrote down Guillermo del Toro doesn't make that right. Yeah. Not make that's it makes that incorrect. So I agree. That's I where agree. I was going off. I I lost the challenge. It was fair that I lost the challenge. <laughs> But we've all seen people just challenge people in order to break momentum. That's or true. To it's, all the time. It's, and it's I don't like that. Okay. I, I don't think it should be the game. I actually think yeah. that's disrespectful to the game. I think it's disrespectful to the judges. Yeah. I think what it boils down to is you are trying to exploit the game. You're trying to confuse the, the situation, trying to confuse the judges in an order to gain an advantage. Mm. I think challenges should be used for when you legitimately think, even if you're wrong, when you legitimately <laughs> think that there is a, a, a problem. Okay. I, think John Drew, I, think his challenges, I think John Drew's challenges were valid. I do too. Nitty, I, a little bit nitty, but challenge, but totally yep. challenge. Yep. What if I, I answered agree. Um, Lord Dick Attenborough? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, no. I don't, Richard fine. Dick. Dick it's you know what? Name. I would. I probably wouldn't have challenged that. I probably wouldn't have challenged okay. that. Okay. It's kind of a silly way to phrase not a, it. Because not a it's not comment easy. on him as a person, just his I, name. If you called him Lord Richie Attenborough, I wouldn't have challenged that. <laughs> oh, yeah. so like, it's, it's short for his name. He's not really credited that right. way. You maybe could challenge that. I suspect they would throw that one out because we know what you mean. Right. But uh, And, of course, that's what they did anyway. Um, but so, that needs uh, to go yeah. anyway. That The whole I idea. So, and, this yeah. is, and this is why I challenged the thing with Ethan. It was about you can't have – Judges go, well, we know what you meant. Because then that has to be consistent throughout the game, which means I can answer Lena Head Headley, and you know who I mean. If that's how we're going, the consistent in consistency needs to be there. This idea of inferring an answer correctly, that's got to go. I, 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 I disagree with that because that's getting someone's name wrong. However, I actually do agree that you're challenged for I challenge I you 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 got their name wrong. Well, Alba, you, Alba is I, getting the name if wrong. If someone asked me, if someone asked me But Alba, right, Alba is would, getting hey, the name wrong. I, I there's an argument to be made there. I'm not gonna fight that. But okay. if someone asked me, hey, who at the Schmodown is the outlaw? <laughs> and I said John Rokla, would you say that I got your name right? No, but they, they would be exactly. like, oh, I know who you mean. I know who you mean. It, you know <laughs> who you mean, but you wouldn't give them any points, and I think that's the issue here. Um, mm. I think your challenge against Ethan, my initial thought with that challenge mm. was that uh, I see your point, but I disagree with it. Right. Because when, when, we, when anyone says it's, – it's the vernacular. When someone says the 60s, you know that they mean the most recent 60s. I thought that that was an unfair challenge. Mm. However, and I'm not sure if you knew this, if you knew this – Yeah. Bravo, 100 bonus points to you. But when I looked it up, there were indeed riots in Detroit in the 1860s. Of course, 1863. Yes. Uh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't know that. And if that's said that, that he was just totally, Rokas said I that in the match, it. too. I, I said it in the year. match. He I didn't say it. the exact year, but he said there were riots in the 1860s. Yeah. I, that's fair. That's yeah. 100%. I missed you saying that. Yeah. But when I saw that and when I looked it up, I'm like, okay, that went from seeming like a superficial challenge to actually being a 100% fair challenge. Yeah, because so they that's asked what decade is it set in? And I know Detroit is set in the 1960s. I know that. However, and I know he probably was saying the right answer or 100% was saying the right, but you got to be specific. 1960s is the answer. So yeah. by not saying 1960s, you're, you know, you're putting, and Mark gave the me question. the challenge by saying, yes, I inferred that you mean, and I was like, okay, that's not something you should be doing. Yeah. No, no. Well, first off, I I, I agree that uh, the host shouldn't be asking, saying anything leading whatsoever. Right. I, I think I agree that that's to Mark's thing. credit, it, it, he owned it. To Mark's credit, oh, he owned it. And listen, it's yeah. listen. If the digital era has changed and everything. Like we had that whole thing yeah. with Ben Goddard, where it used to be that like mm. we're far enough away from the hosts that if he made some bird noises, it wouldn't affect us more than anything else. Right, we're wearing headphones right. now, and that's right in our ears. And I yep. think that that I actually, if I was his manager i would have challenged that yep. i would have said like you just completely distracted the competitor in a completely unusual way and that question should be thrown out and we should get a new i one. agree with you man i yep. think that should have been a thing but we're learning you know there are yep, different are. things that are, that are coming together and you know we're working on the rules and hopefully these sorts of things will get ironed out and be more solidified <laughs> so that there won't be <laughs> any exploits. there shouldn't be hopefully but like there shouldn't yeah. be exploits i agree it should be it should be i i think this is wrong because of the context and art is subjective and there's a lot of yeah. things that can be kind of right but also kind of wrong and we can have a conversation about that but i don't i think the era in which we even are willing to exploit the system and exploit the fact that 
you know, cinema is subjective and the rules aren't necessarily always as well codified as they possibly could be. And to exploit that just for gain, not because we're trying to represent the movies accurately, but because we just want to win. I'm, I don't think the person who is a champion at this league, yeah. doesn't matter what division, should be someone who figured out how to game the system. I think it should be the person who knows the most about movies. That's fair. That's fair. I appreciate yeah. that opinion. Yeah. Uh, all right, Alan Smithy, good to see Wait. you, my man. Let me just say thank you. Good to meet you, Bibbs. I think you guys both should stay in the schmo down until you're on your deathbeds answering questions. And then you go, ah. Yeah. And then I wake up one more time. Joseph Cotton was in Citizen Kane. <laughs> <laughs> it would do a sorry, Thomas. sorry to all the jocks I offended. Uh, no offense, oh. guys. Don't yeah, come and no. my ass. No, What's no. It's totally fine. Tom, we're going to be like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. We're going to die within hours of each other uh, competing in a Schmodown match. That's basically when we're 80 that. years old. We're 80 years old. They died within hours of each other? I didn't yeah. know that. On the oh, same sorry. day. Interesting. I mean, wow. sucks, sucks to die, See? but like that's an interesting bit of trivia. I know history. John Adams died and said, yeah. well, at least Thomas Jefferson is still alive to carry on the legacy of the founding fathers, and he died hours later. So now you're making you me suspect their wives of foul play or something. <laughs> that's very, um, uh, that's the very founding, sexist of you. The founding Come mothers. Hey <laughs> Sorry, man. All right. Thanks, Alan. Good to see you. Thank you. you, guys. Thank you, and have a good night. You too. you too. All right. I've got a bunch of Streamlabs and Super Chats I need to run okay. through before we get to more live we'll, questions. We'll try to do them as fast as we can. Yeah. Can we do them one-word one, one word answers I'll, as we I'll, go? Yeah, I'll try. I'll All try. right. <laughs> I do want to get to this, uh, the first one that was in from yeah. – uh, where was he? Uh, Vincent Zawada. He said, hey, Bibbs, who's your favorite director and movie? So can you do a concise? Uh, okay. Favorite living director. I'm okay. going to say Mamoru Husoda, the director of Summer Wars and Wolf Children and The Boy and the Beast. Okay. Amazing animated filmmaker from Japan. Every single one of his movies makes me cry. Okay. Um, and uh, favorite director of all time uh, is probably Orson Welles. Um yeah. Favorite uh, movies? I actually have two favorite movies. They're just tied, and I try to watch them on my birthday. Uh, it's Searching for Bobby Fischer. Great film. Uh, biopic about a teen ch – uh, uh, it's not even a teen, like a kid chess prodigy. Yep. Absolutely perfect movie. Find a flaw, I dare you. And yep. also the uh, the hacker thriller Sneakers, which has one of the best ensemble casts ever and is impeccable. Yeah. Like yeah. absolutely perfect from stop to finish. So uh, those those would be my answers. Searching for Bobby Fischer is one I go back to all the time. So I'm, a, I'm obsessed with Bobby Fischer as yeah. a exploration of the mental uh, cliffs you can fall off when you become so obsessed with one thing. Yeah. And I'm reading his uh, his uh, by, uh, the book they wrote about him, uh, Endgame, the Endgame book. It's fascinating. Oh. And I saw that documentary that they did on him for HBO that is just incredible, incredible. Um, let's see, uh, Andrew H. Bibbs, uh, the way you break down movies is fascinating. Big, critically acclaimed fan. What was your three most anticipated movies of the of this year, assuming no release dates had been changed? What three uh, are you most looking forward to? I, I'll, I need to answer this in a weird way, but I'll try to make it quick. Uh, okay. I, actually, as a critic, I try not to anticipate movies okay. because I think when, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, I think when you build up a movie in your head, you end up making the movie compete with whatever you've come up with, and you might miss the movie that you're seeing. So I try not to anticipate but that being said, we all have exceptions. And for me, the only movie I was super stoked about this year was In the Heights. Oh, yeah. In the yeah. Heights looked wonderful. The trailer's fantastic. I love I have, I've never seen the play, but I've heard the soundtrack. And mm -hmm. I think John M. Chu was a really great filmmaker, and I couldn't wait to see what he did with it. And right. it bugs me that that got pushed back a whole year. So that's yep. one I, I wish I could see right now. Okay. Uh, William says, William, uh, Adam Jimenez says, William, I think that the real problem with the Paramount Agreement being one being gone is, yeah. quote, blocking movies more than studio owning theaters. That way studios control the movies that accompany the blockbuster. Do you agree? I think they've been kind of doing that anyway. When you look at a lot of the agreements that Disney had sure. in order to show movies like Avengers Endgame, they say, in order to show this movie at your theater, you have to show it in this many theaters for this many weeks, and that pushes out other movies. So it doesn't matter if only one person is seeing Endgame. They are preventing other movies from being able to compete. This is anti-competitive capitalist behavior, and this is one of the things that that Paramount Decree was supposed to prevent. So yeah. I actually think that... The, losing the Paramount Decree is really troubling and it really sucks. And we need to litigate something similar 
ASAP because we're going to run into entertainment monopolies and we're getting there already. Yeah, yeah. When you look at the way that streaming services for each individual studio is basically a new form of vertical integration, yeah. there was already a lawsuit from the creators of Bones over Fox making a, a, back, a, a back-end deal with Hulu rather than trying to find a home for that show that actually made them the most money right. to the point where executives were signing both sides of the contract between Fox and Hulu and that is absolutely inappropriate. Yeah. So yeah. we need to come up with new rules about this. I understand that the Paramount decree is a little outdated, but we needed it. Yep, agreed. Alex O'Neill says, uh, Bibbs, you mentioned that you often disagree with Siskel and Ebert on their opinions. What yep. was their one opinion you mostly strong, strongly disagreed with on a movie? It's hmm. a tough probably, question. Probably Silent Night, Deadly Night. Ooh, I think uh, horrible. the when Silent Night Deadly Night came out in 1984, uh, it was a slasher. If you've never seen it, it's a slasher about a kid who is traumatized at Christmas, and he grows up and he ends up being forced to put on a Santa Claus costume for work, and he snaps and goes on a killing spree. It's a very simple movie on some levels, but it's actually pretty pointed in the way that it indicts the whole Christmas season and everything negative about it. Yep, Siskel and Ebert went on TV and wrote, read the names of everyone associated with the movie and just said, shame, like in that episode <laughs> of Game of Thrones, because yeah. they thought it was just cruelly and disgustingly subverting this pure childhood fantasy. Um, I thought that was an incredibly simple-minded uh, perspective on the film. Um, so that really bugged me a lot. The thing that probably annoyed me more than anything else was when Ebert said that video games could not be art. Ah, uh, yeah. That I thought was that I thought was incredibly like short sighted of him, and it mm -hmm. bothered me that he took such a hardline stance on it. Mm -hmm. um, are the it's, it's like it's like the Last Jedi. You know, you want to maybe inspire people, but you also want the next generation to hopefully be even better than you. Yeah. So as wonderful as Eber and Siskel were, they were the product of their own generation. They were the product of their own ideas, yeah. and hopefully, ideas will evolve over time and improve even more. And a critic should not gatekeep art, for God's sake. Definitely right. not. No. Uh, D Train says, "Do you think movie theaters should allow security personnel into each screening to make sure everyone keeps their mask on, especially after they're eating and drinking? I honestly would feel a lot safer." Well, we used to have ushers in a theater all yes. the time. There yes. used to be. We used to be able to spend enough money in a theater where there would be someone in the theater all the time yeah. just to make sure that nothing's going on no one's doing anything inappropriate here's your seat True. and that was part of the system so it's not actually that weird an idea i still think it's a bad idea to open up movie theaters at all yep i agree with but you man if, but if we must the idea of having someone there to sort of make sure that because it's a darkened theater people are behind you it's also a room where air is circulating so if you take off your mask and laugh mm -hmm. or guffaw or something like that all of those droplets are going to get around in the theater and that's actually more dangerous. Yeah. So again, I don't think we should have them open at all, but if we must, that makes sense to me, but it is, I think you should get hazard pay for that. Cause that's, yeah. that, that's dangerous. I agree with you a thousand yeah. percent. It's ridiculous. And also these, these studios need to make links available to us to review these films for God's sake. So we're frustrated by the new mutant uh, situation. I, they're not, are they not going to send any no, links? To that? Not from new uh, mutants for what no, I'm hearing no, no. and possibly not even tenant. So other people yeah. will be able to get a chance to those. Um, then at least, right. whatever. Anyway, go ahead, go ahead. What were you say? At least what? No, it, it sucks. It sucks. It's a bad okay. situation. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, when Edward says, I'm one of the few Roka fans who doesn't follow the Schmodown. I used to, though. I am a big Bibiani fan. Oh, through, through his film reviews and the podcast, critically acclaimed an excellent writer with a unique viewpoint. There you go. Oh. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Yeah, give Wayne Edwards giving you some love. Uh, you. Robert Robert Cordova said, if we wanted to grow his film criticism of sports documentaries, which he has stated was his blind spot, where would he like to start? Hmm, I can well, give him like thirty choices oh, yeah. that we could start with. It's not so much that sports documentaries yeah. are my blind spot. It's just that I got kind of late into documentaries as a genre as a whole. Uh, yeah, and I'm a little bit behind on them in general. And there's just so much, and I have trouble making the time to sit down and watch every prominent documentary ever mm -hmm. made. So mm -hmm. uh, if they ever had documentaries as a wheel slice, I might be in some trouble. But <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a lot. I know I, I know that there's a lot of prominent uh, sports documentaries and other documentaries that yeah. I've uh, never seen. John, real fast, rattle off three of your favorites, and I'll try O.J. To made in America. I think every I, person should I see that. I have seen that. I okay. have seen that. That's okay. a seven-parter that's incredible. Yeah, it is another great. great. Another great sports documentary, and even if you're not a basketball fan, uh, seeing The Last Dance, the one that just came out on Netflix, all oh, okay. eight or nine episodes, 
Uh, incredible documentary. Also, the Magic Bird documentary that the NBA Network did yeah. is one of those ones that will really kind of get in. And you understand the spirit of competition. No matter what side you're on, yeah. the spirit of competition is something to explore there. That's a th those are great documentaries that you can okay. have some fun with. Uh, and I, you know, if you want to watch the James uh, the James Toback Tyson documentary, I think that's an interesting exploration of a guy who you could absolutely hate but watch the progression of him as he speaks about his life and to where he's trying to achieve a better understanding of the evil that he had done in the past or the mistakes he had made in the past so that's a fascinating one as well um all right let's see what we got here uh robert Cardo, oh yeah okay uh, nolan de palma said nolan de palma nice says a remake i think that gets judged way too hard is rob zombies halloween and halloween 2 uh, I cannot agree, but you go ahead and defend that. I don't. I don't I, 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 I don't like the Rob Zombie's first Halloween. I okay. think he kind of missed the point of the original, and I think yes. what he turned. But I'm okay with that if he had done something really interesting with it, and I don't think he did. Mm -hmm. I think, and by trying to give Michael Myers proper motivation and a backstory, he just kind of simplified everything and made he it killed it. Boring. Yeah. Kind of. I do actually kind of like his Halloween too, because I think what Halloween two does okay. is it actually takes. Because the actual Halloween sequels, most of them are a mixed bag at best, and a lot of them are really quite bad at all. But right. what he did with Halloween 2, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, is he took the handful of ideas from all of the sequels, yeah. and he just picked the interesting ones, and he put them all in one film. And so I actually think if you look at that movie as a remake of Halloween 2, 4, 5, and 6 mm – -hmm. It is better than those movies. Yeah. And I actually think it's kind of ambitious and exciting. And yeah, it's a sequel and it follows up on a movie I don't like, but there's a lot mm -hmm. of really good performances in there and a lot of really bold ideas in there. And I would have been yeah. really excited to see where he would have gone with the next film in the series based on how that movie ended. So I like Halloween 2 quite a bit. Halloween, Rob Zombie's Halloween, not a big fan of, but I do see what he was going for. And I don't think it's the worst horror remake ever. Fair. Okay. One last thing. Corey Cameron suggests the two Escobars absolutely that's one another a great sports documentary you can yeah. watch pablo escobar mirrored with the s of the colombian player escobar who scores an own goal that helps the united states advance in the world cup but what happens in that country as a result great documentary uh Exciting. joseph curran says uh hey guys i hope you guys are staying safe and healthy question for the both of you what are some movies you think are classics that other people may not see as classics also, what are some classics you do not consider to be in that category? All right, two choices. Uh, clue. Uh, <laughs> it's right there. Yeah, what am I to get this shot? And I know. <laughs> no, it's not a shot. I consider Clue to be a comedy class. This became a whole yeah. thing earlier. Uh, but, but Clue, Clue is definitely one of them. I think we're approaching this point. Where, it's interesting because there are two kinds of distinctions of classics. Where right, modern and there, yeah. Well, there are modern classics, and I think it's important that we draw a distinction because if we just call every old movie that is good a classic, we run the risk of not talking about the genuinely old movies anymore, yep. as yep. because again, there's recency bias. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go at some more recent stuff. I think uh, I, Clue is an example here. Um, I would call Galaxy Quest a modern comedy classic. Oh, that's a great I think one. That's, I think that's it's another one movie where it's just kind of perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so those are those are two off the top of my head. Uh, okay. I'm sure I can come up with better ones, but, John, what about you? What about two ones that you don't that you don't want to be uh, you don't want them to be called classics well classics and it's tricky because sometimes a movie isn't good but it made an impact and it's hard mm -hmm. to really deny a classic status like i think forrest gump for example is actually oh. kind of an insidious and negative movie in a lot of ways but it's a major step yeah. forward in visual effects and i love gary sinise in that movie so okay. it's not a complete wash but i think it's not nearly as good as it was brought out to be okay. uh, when it came out um i would also want to veto uh, for classic status. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. That is really – Chicago. Okay. All I right. think Chicago is, is an okay – I think it's a three-star musical that should yeah. never have been considered a four-star musical. It is just okay. Okay. Yeah. I would throw out uh, the two to remove. I would remove Gone with the Wind in a heartbeat. If you burned oh, that you film and never yeah. showed it again, I'd be happy. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd also would throw out Gulliver's Travels. I don't think Gulliver's Travels is as much of a classic anymore. I think we've the animated seen one? huh the animated version. No, no, no. The uh, the um. I'm sorry, Sullivan's Travel. Sullivan's Travel. Sorry, oh, Sullivan's Travel. Sullivan's Travel. Okay, Sullivan's yeah, yeah, Travel. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, I would I would remove that one because we've story. seen better versions of that story told uh, throughout the history of, of of film since. So I don't think it's as, as powerful as uh, people might think. Uh, there's a fantastic French film, huh? Mm. 
I'd fight you on that, but I'm just making okay. Point uh, we can do that. There's yeah. maybe someday we'll have that show. <laughs> the sure. fantastic. I think one of the things that people forget when they think about classics is uh, 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 international films or foreign films. Yeah. There's a fantastic French film with Gerard Depardieu called uh, "Tous les Montants du Monde," which is all the mornings of the world. That mm -hmm. motherfucking film is an incredibly beautiful classic. And if you haven't watched that, uh, find it somehow and watch it. It stars. Depardieu's son as himself in a younger version and flash and flash forwards uh, or back and forth. Sorry, it goes back and forth in time telling the story of the older Depardieu and the younger Depardieu and this great romance uh, that happened in his life and how it was tied to him learning how to play the cello. It is a phenomenal mm -hmm. film uh, that people don't talk about or no one ever references ever. And it is one of these classics that no one talks about. So I would throw that on the pile. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's an older classic. I mean, I, I love, uh, uh, it's always fair weather. I think for a Gene oh, Kelly musical, that, it's that incredibly roller skating dark. Sequence, that roller skating sequence is like Mad Max Fury Road level intense. Yeah. Like that is, a, that is an amazing, except for that one little bit where it's racist for like three seconds. <laughs> it's like every yeah. other part of it is like super impressive and amazing. Yeah. Yep. I like myself. That's the song. And then when they do the trash can dance with the lids, that's incredible. Uh, but for yeah. a musical to be that dark and also have a very strong female protagonist who does not yeah. need to be the love interest, that's Sid Charisse's character. I yeah. think that film needs to be talked about more as a musical's classic, in my opinion. I 100% um, agree. Thank you, man. All right, let's see. I wish see, I thought uh, of more older movies, but I just, whatever. That's I all right. I think it's good to have a mix. Yeah. All right, fair enough. JJ underscore Winward says, growl, growl. Hey, guys. Growl. What's your favorite Edward G. Robinson movie? Ooh, that's a toughie. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna say five star final. Ooh, nice reference. That's Shit. an amazing motion picture that people do okay. not talk about enough. Uh, okay. It's a, it's an early 30s film. Edward G. Robinson stars as a newspaper editor who, okay. because of the absolute intense, and this is something we're dealing with now, yeah. newspapers didn't used to be once a day. They used to come out all the time. Right. And so there was a 24-hour news cycle in the 1930s, and people forget this. Wow. And he's trying to get as much of a story as he can out of this sort of public interest piece about this woman who was accused of murder or something like right. that. And right. now her daughter is getting married. And in order to sell papers, they're just destroying this family. Yeah. And it's about over the course of the day, he realizes that the whole system of media is broken and that they are valuing money over actually giving people news that is relevant and significant. And it is super intense. It's super amazing. It's, Sounds it's familiar. Carl, isn't Boris Karloff in that movie and he plays like uh, a super creepy reporter? Is now you're taking Karloff? a shot. Now you're taking a shot. I, no, I'm, just, I'm not kidding. It, it, <laughs> but like, even so, that movie is absolutely amazing. We don't talk about it enough. Fair, absolutely fair. Yeah. Uh, my tie is, uh, and I'm I'm going standard. He made a great uh, deep cut for me. It's either Double Indemnity or Key Largo. I do yeah. like him as a lead in the movies that he's in, but I think he's even more powerful when he's a member of the ensemble because he brings such a weight and power to the role that he is playing. And in Key Largo, he is so unsettling and chilling. I compare it to uh, Robert De Niro's like limited time in American Hustle. That scene with him is so unsettling. Uh, it's em embracing how to be evil. And of course, with a double indemnity, that's a role he rarely plays. The guy who's like the more relaxed, logical, intelligent guy in the whole situation. You yeah. rarely see Edward G play a character like that. It was a great color to watch him, uh, uh, to watch him play that in that film. Um, all right. Uh, let's see real quick. Oh, we've got two more and then we'll jump into live questions and then we'll get uh, Bibbs right. out of here. We're taking so much of his time. Uh, Tushka says, great chatting with you both, Bibbs. If you joined Roka in a Western themed faction, he'd spin away from it. He wouldn't join <laughs> me and had to change your nickname. What would you choose? Oh. I could see you bang pots and pans like Will Ferrell's prospect Gus Chiggins. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, if I had a Western themed name, wow. uh, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of like what my favorite Westerns are. Like, probably mm. my favorite Westerns are like the real down and dirty spaghetti Westerns that don't get talked about as much, like uh, Django Kill, If You Live Shoot, or Manaha, right. Man Called Blade. Um, so, the Steiger one is good too. Yeah, What's the maybe, Steiger one, Duck You Sucker. I oh, like Duck You one. Sucker is fantastic. It's usually that? called. It used to be called Fistful of Dynamite, but now it's been like properly relabeled Duck right. You Sucker. That right. movie's phenomenal. I saw that at the New Beverly uh, yeah. uh, before they shut it down last uh, last year. Yeah, yeah, that movie's great. Um, I think I think I would go for in, in a. Uh, uh, if you did, you ever see Manaha, a Man Called Blade? 
Things no, are, it's, it's really that? it's really fun. It's just this, okay. it's in many respects it's this typical man with no name comes into town, cleans up the place. It has an absolutely phenomenal song score. Like all okay. of the songs are unforgettable, and it's just a really fun, brutal uh, western. But I love that movie for two reasons. Uh-huh. One, it has one of my favorite lines. Uh, in a movie ever, which is, my name is on the wind, blowing over my father's grave. That's what he says instead of his name. It's a it's great, line. great line. Uh, but the other thing is is that it's called Manaha, a man called Blade, and his, Manaha translates to hatchet. So uh, so it's actually inaccurate. Uh, so I think I would probably go as, like, the hatchet. Like, William <laughs> the hatchet Bibiani. Like, that Ooh, might be. Yikes. That comes to mind. I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's bad. <laughs> I'd probably come up with something better. I think the Switch brother might fight you on that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I like that. Okay. <laughs> what about what, what, what about you? What would you name me? Name you? Yeah, name me. What if you gave me a Western mm. name? Be fair. I will give me fair. Bibs, 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 bibs. I don't know. Bibs the kid oh. comes to mind. Bibs. Yeah, but the kid's taken. Can't yeah, get the kid, kid is taken. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's it hard. Is. It's really, really hard. It's hard to come up with a good name. I came up with a. Did you have any other? I'm curious. Quick, quick. And the dead. quick and the Dead. How about the Quick and the Dead, Bibiani? Ooh, the Quick and the Dead. You can be like just that. as. You can, you can be I dead like quickly when you play Bibiani. I, right. I like that. I like that. Yeah. All, right. All right. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, Canada Rosak says, I'm almost as old as Roca, so I was alive in the mid 70s. It's a Wonderful Life became popular since it fell into public domain in 74. Yes. And TV stations ran it nonstop during Christmas. The remake in 77 was made because of this popularity, not vice versa. Interesting. That's uh, uh, based on when I when I did a podcast about the Marlo Thomas version. Yeah. Uh, the research I did said that that really boosted the visibility of it. Okay. But. Uh, I, you know, history isn't cut and dry and it's usually not super bullet pointy. So yeah. that, it's probably a little bit of both, but fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. I remember what I remember watching it all the time. So one of my favorite yeah, movies, bar none, you would watch it on like channel 54 and then switch over to channel 12 and it's starting all over again. It was great to be able to watch on multiple things before NBC took it over. Uh, Canada Rosak says one more. He said, Hey, Bibbs, what old comedy pre 1970s mm. do you think has held up the best? Ooh, that's really hard because there's a lot. Um, I would say either some of Buster Keaton stuff, like Our Hospitality. Oh, yeah. Or uh, for Going for Sound Era, Arsenic and Old Lace. Oh, I love that movie. Crazy oh. funny, like super crazy funny. Like Johnny. start to finish. Johnny. Yeah. So those are, those are the first two that come to mind. I'm sure you can come up with more, though. I still think uh, um, some like it hot holds up. I watched it again yep, a, a couple of months ago, and I was like, "This is just genius from it top really to is. bottom. Absolute genius. Very, Charmous very funny film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I agree with you on Arsenal and Lace. That's one of my mother's favorites, and we watched it all the time growing up. So, yeah. all right, let's let's bring on three live questions, and then we got to wrap this thing up. It has been very kind to stay as long as he has. Thank you, man. No um, uh, Malcolm Lay from uh, New Zealand. What's up, Malcolm? What do you got Hi. for us? <laughs> Hi, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I it's one of those ones like I had a question, but then I changed it based on other things. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but this one is like I'm, you're talking about um, how classic movies don't get um, any much appreciation these days. But is there any classic movies that you think people need to check out? Mm. I think there are hundreds, but um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like what are the ones that like your your life is incomplete. Mm. Unless you like watch these movies, um, in which case, mm, All Quiet on the Western Front comes to mind again. But I did just say that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, it happened one night. Is the movie that gave us oh. the modern comedy as we know it. Yeah, so you should cool. probably at least see that. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here. Citizen Kane really is as good as they say. Seven yes. Samurai is the movie that is responsible for giving us the modern action movies. You should definitely see that. Uh, Psycho split film history in half. So you should definitely see that, even though parts of it are problematic. Um, let's see here. Roka, help me out here. Any other ideas? I, I would say The Godfather Part Two. I think you, how you not well, watch that one? one? Yeah, one. Yeah, I've, I've, I've I've <laughs> I mean, two is my one. I would say The Searchers. Uh, that that yeah. is such an unconventional. Western in that uh, it is a Western that explores the uh, you have a protagonist that is not easily likable and is yeah. racist and is difficult to navigate. But what he's doing is showing you that uh, in certain situations, uh, you may not like the hero, 
but the hero is the one who can get the job done. And it's up to you to decide if it's savory or unsavory to you. And yeah. I think it's one of the greatest beginnings and endings, the door opening and the door closing, the yeah. new and the old. It's a fantastic juxtaposition. I uh, just rewatched that. It holds up so good. Yeah, it doesn't it? Really. It, so it does. I was good. I was worried it wouldn't because I hadn't seen it in like 10 years. But then yeah. I was like, yeah, that still, that still works. Damn it. Yeah. Um, definitely. Wizard of Oz is another one. That oh, is yeah. A linchpin in, in popular culture. You yeah. definitely need to see that. I'd um, say network uh, certainly yeah. very. It was prescient and now topical. It was prescient and now absolutely topical for what you see going on in the networks. Yeah. All the president's um, men is a damn good one as well. The Exorcist is an amazing horror oh, movie, yeah. but I also think it's one of the smartest movies about the constant battle in the modern era between uh, faith and secularism. Yeah. Uh, so it works on a variety of levels. That movie is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, Ah, uh, Ozzy's Tokyo Story. You got to see that at some point in your life, I think. I think you have uh, to. Didn't you have to throw in a Hitchcock? Don't we have to throw? I mean, not the, wait, not I mean Rear Window. You said Psycho. Rear Window. If you got to pick, yeah. you gotta pick another Hitchcock, I think Rear Window is actually his best film. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly his tightest constructed, but yeah. you could you could do no wrong with Rear Window, Shadow of a Doubt, um, yeah, Shadow Thirty Nine Steps. Thirty Nine Steps invented the modern suspense thriller. Love as Thirty Nine. Know it. Uh, it's absolutely a game changer in cinema history. I want that five pointer. Who stars in Thirty Nine Steps? Robert Donat. Give me my Robert, victory. Give I, me my victory. Give me a chance, but Robert Donat. <laughs> I just saw him. In Goodbye, Mr. Chips. I've never seen it. Before. Oh, yeah. He's Good. a killer in that. That's an amazing yeah. performance. Um, so hopefully that gives you some stuff to work with. But basically, you know, all of film history leads up to the to the films we have now. Yeah. Um, we actually have a fun podcast at the Critically Claimed Network now called Episode Zero, where we're looking at the prehistory of Star Wars and all of the movies that inspired Star Wars. Um and I think that's something really exciting way to learn about film history is to take something you currently like and look at all the things that led to it. Oh, um, that's so cool. that's definitely something you can check out if you want to learn a few more of those. And yeah, um, yeah. I already do check it out. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, fair enough. Awesome. Thank you, Ma- Malcolm. It's good thank to you. see you, brother. Uh, see ya. Much respect, man. Thank you. All right, Corey Richmond, you're coming in. What's up, Corey? What do you got for us? Hey, guys. Uh, first of all, I just want to say really enjoy a Cancel Too Soon podcast. It's uh, especially uh, almost human. I know that's from a couple of years ago, but really oh, enjoyed uh, that that's episode. A cool show. And- and you know, really loved when you guys spoke about that uh, that episode. But um, I was just wondering uh, your opinion. I had two different things I was thinking about, but I'll ask the Schmo down one. Uh, now in the digital era, you have the, the pay per view matches and stuff. But when you guys were taping matches and you had to talk about matches that had already taped, how hard is it hmm. to go and talk about a match that's already <laughs> happened without you know, like promoting a match that's you know. That you know that you either won or lost, and trying it's to so score, hard. You know. yeah. It's so hard, especially if you lost. It's yeah. so hard now because you know that you're trying to hype up the match, and you know that eventually someone's going to be disappointed in you if they were like excited to see you, and it and it hurts. It sucks, yeah. and that's the same. That was the same before the digital era as well. It's you always you always record it in advance, yeah. um, except unless it's live, which isn't most matches. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's difficult. I, what I try to do is I just try to remember when it's like talk about what's coming up in the match. Is just try to remember where my head was the day before the match. What was I thinking then? And right. just say that. And whether that's me feeling good about myself or bad about myself, doesn't matter. Just try to go to wherever your headspace was before you played. It's the only yeah. thing you can do, really. I mean, uh, it does get easier as you play longer because you're just like, oh, you take the losses, you take the victories. It's part of it. Um, but when it first started doing it, I'm with it was really hard. I mean, I, I had a hard time promoting stuff I was going to lose uh, or knew I had lost the match. And it, 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 sometimes it was a month ahead of time to keep talking about oh, it. And it, it was the worst. Um, death. Yeah, so death, basically death. So I'd bad. rather just, okay, it's out. It's done. Let's talk yeah. about it. Let's move on. You know, so uh, it, it is very difficult, but you got to be in service of the game. And that's yeah. part of the deal. If you're going to be part of the game, that's uh, that's just accepted. It, it's just like if you're made a movie and you got to do a press junket on it and you want yeah. to talk about the twist ending. You can't yet. Yeah. Eventually you will be able to, but right now no one's seen it. You can't yet. Or you know that you're on you're in a bad movie and you just got to yeah. keep promoting it because it's and in your contract. You sign the contract. You can't yep. say anything bad about it until after <laughs> it's out. And then it's like, you know what movie sucked? That last one I did. And then it's okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Corey. You got, you got one more? Or are you good? Oh uh, yeah, actually, uh, this is—I uh, don't know how much. It is. I think this is an interesting one. I was watching because uh, you're a wrestling guy. NXT last week, and right after it ended, Rush mm-hmm. Hour came on, and right before it started, there was a thing right before saying this movie was made in the '90s when 
raunchy comedies were uh, more, I guess, accepted. It was basically Wait, there was a hour? disclaimer before Rush Hour. Of all yeah, things, so, Rush so Hour. That's cop, you know, buddy cop movies. We you know like the the, the jokes were more accepted kind of thing. Oh. And I just wondered, no, I, what I just, point of view on this? You know, with these disclaimers. I understand like with uh, <sighs> Gone with the Wind and stuff where they yeah. you know, the controversy taking off and they put things on. But you know, I was wondering what your guys' point of view with you know having these I mean, disclaimers on these movies. Now. I haven't seen the original Rush Hour since shortly after it came out, so yeah. I'm a little hazy on whether there's anything uniquely offensive in that movie. I mean, obviously, it's a story about East meets West, and there's well, his a story accent. About he does kind yeah, of make fun accent. of his accent, and, yeah. and that's offensive, and it always yep. was. And you know, we can say it was never funny, and it probably wasn't, and yeah. that's fine. Uh, but uh, I think, listen. Attitudes and, and things change over time. I actually – here's an example. I watched Bad Boys for Life. I missed it in theaters. Okay. And then I was like, I got to see this movie. It's going to come up on the Schmodown eventually. So at the very least, I got to see it. And so I watched it a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, never before has a movie aged so rapidly <laughs> because – after the protests that we had, like in May, and we all started really sort of rethinking the way that media has been portraying the police, and we should have been thinking about this for decades, but we have really all started thinking about it simultaneously, mm -hmm. about how the media has portrayed lawless police officers as uh, heroes, yeah. and we've been doing that for forever, and Bad Boys, like, it begins with them endangering public safety all throughout yeah. the city of Miami, uh, just so that they can get to like a hospital in time to like have a baby. I'm like, oh my god, that was not an emergency. People could have died. <laughs> and then you have scenes of like Will Smith torturing guys to get information, but it's okay because he got the information. And it's just yeah. like, yeah, you know what? All of that's we can swear here, right? Yeah, of course. All of that is fucked. Mm -hmm. All of that should always have been fucked. And if you're gonna portray it, you have to be willing to say that it is fucked. Yeah. And yet this is one of those movies where it's okay because Will Smith is doing it, and it's right. not. Right. So attitudes will change. These will shift over time. Hopefully we'll all become better people. The, mm -hmm. It surprises me that they would go out of their way for rush hour of all films, but right. eh, whatever. No, I don't know. No. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get too up in arms about it. True. Fair. Uh, and if they go too far, then we'll, eh. I think we'll, it'll, 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 it'll retract. Though, isn't it? True. Cause I didn't it, know they were doing it for this. And obviously yeah. channels must be taking it upon themselves to put these disclaimers yeah. up uh, and not necessarily have it be public knowledge. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate you stopping in, and thanks for being patient to come on. Keep up the great work, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. All right. One last one, and we'll let you go, Bibbs. It's sure. Brennan. Hey, Brennan. Good to see you again, hey, man. Hey, Bibbs. Hey, Rocco. How you doing? I'm doing good. So great. my question is, have you? What's an example you can think of of a movie where something either you didn't want to happen, or something that you initially didn't like? The more you thought about it, the more you realized you liked that decision. That's an interesting question. Mm. That's a really interesting question. It has definitely happened, and I'm on a bit on the spot, and I'm trying to think to myself, what's an example of this? Like, I, I mm. Roka, is anything coming to your mind first? So you're, you're saying you saw something in a film and you didn't like it, or you saw something in a film and you didn't like it and then liked it later? Yeah. yeah, you realize yeah. later you, that you it was initially work. didn't like it, and then later you went, "Oh, okay." Yeah, that's rough. That's a that is a tough one. Uh, I will say, uh, in Man of Steel, the snapping of the neck. I will mm -hmm. say, when I saw it in the movie, okay. and I love the movie, when I saw yeah. it in the yeah, theater, yeah, yeah. when the neck snap happened, I remember thinking, <gasps> but then when I saw it again, and you see the painful cry that he has yes. killed the only other remaining Kryptonian yeah. that he knows uh, on that, that he is, that he has made himself the last Kryptonian ever mm -hmm. by his own hand. Uh, that really just destroyed me watching it the second time. Yeah. I understood what the point of that moment was. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good yeah. one. I actually disagree with Roka on that, but I can totally appreciate that. I, yeah. That's actually one where the opposite happened, where initially I was sort of fine with the ending of that movie because uh, I thought that they were like kind of working their way around a lot of the criticisms about like all the collateral damage. Like, well, maybe they had had time to, metro to evacuate. Oh, yeah, that with, kind of stuff. It would have yeah. been fine. And then they doubled down in Batman v Superman, and that yeah. made Batman a little worse. I agree. That was annoying. Um, yeah. think, actually, that's such a good question. Like, what's a movie where I didn't care for it, and then I realize now that that was, like, the right decision? Or it's a movie you saw and you didn't like it first, and then you went, oh, okay, it's okay. 
Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's definitely happened. God, I don't know why am I blinking on this. I feel so irresponsible. <laughs> it's okay. You've been on for two and a half hours, I, man. I have, but I, I podcast for longer than this. I have like I have three hours of podcasting to do later tonight. So that's oh, Jesus, I really got to get. I really okay. got to get on my game. Uh, okay, here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Okay, okay. and this, this is not going to win me any brownie points. Uh, uh, Jaws: The Revenge. Oh, I actually the came around. Movie? Not the entire movie, but parts of it. And here's why. Okay. Jaws the Revenge has a stupid premise for a movie. Because the idea yes. is, after, after four Jaws movies, uh, it's uh, the mo- the mother of the whole family. She was married to her shot. What's her name? Oh, Lorraine uh, Gray. Lorraine, Lorraine Gray. Gray. Lorraine Gary, yeah. 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 Uh, Gary, but yeah. Uh, oh, she, Gary, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, the idea is that she's lost so many family members to this damn shark that she feels like she's haunted by it and that it's actually coming after her. And then it turns out the shark is. And it turns out there was this whole subplot that they cut about the shark witch literally doctor, being her. Yeah, and the yeah, witch doctor. Ter- terrible, terrible, terrible. But yeah. if you remove that, if you if you remove the literal quality of the film and just say, oh, there's a shark hunting her across the planet, mm. it's kind of stupid. But if you look at it as an allegory for a woman trying to deal with trauma and everyone telling her, no, your trauma is stupid, and then in the end, oh, when she's being attacked by that shark, that yeah. amazing shot of her looking at someone being attacked by that shark and going, fuck it, I'm ending this, and just yeah. running back. Lorraine Gary is awesome in that movie, and from her perspective as a woman who no one is listening to, that I, movie is better know, than good. it gets credit for. That is an, an, a point I had never considered. That is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it, it's still it's still a sloppy movie. There's well, a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. it, but there is also yeah. enough good in it that I think it deserves a little bit more credit for being better than its reputation, at least. Okay. okay. Right. There we go. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Brennan. Thank Appreciate you, you stopping in, brother. Question. All right. Thanks. Good to see you. You too. Uh, one last thing to say on that. Le- Lorraine Gary uh, retired after that movie. Never she worked did. again. Never That's a worked shame, again. She's really good in it. She's yes, a she really was. Good actor. Yeah. She was married to uh, Sid Sheinberg her entire life till he passed away last year. So uh, shout oh, yeah. out to wow. her. I think right. she did. And apparently, uh, Back to the Future's mom is named after her. She's Lorraine okay. Leah Thompson. Is this an homage to her? So I did not know that. That's really nice. There you cool. go. Uh, one last thing, Fantastic three fourteen says, "Great question. I kind of like Need for Speed, but the more I saw it, the more I liked it." All right, interesting. I haven't revisited that one. Mm-hmm. I liked the premise. Obviously, I thought they did a good job keeping it direct. Yeah. But I don't know why. I never really connected. Maybe I would have rewatch. That's fair. Uh, all right. Well, th- thank you, Wayne. But dude, there was more I wanted to get into. But like, the fans yeah. take over and ask their questions, and I think I hope you had a good time answering and yeah. and talking with everybody about stuff. This was a blast. Thank you so much. And if you ever want me back, I'll be around. So there absolutely. You go. Uh, please plug everything you got going oh, on, my man. I have so much. Okay. So uh, with COVID and everything, a lot of the places where I was writing, I'm not, there's, there's, I've been furloughed. So I've right. been focusing a lot on the podcast. So what we have is the critically acclaimed network. Uh, and that is a series of podcasts hosted by myself and Whitney Seibold. There's our show, Critically Acclaimed, where we review new movies. Uh, there's our show, We've Got Mail, where we answer your letters and talk about more serious topics about film recommendations and film history and controversies, etc. Uh, we have a show called Cancel Too Soon, where we review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. We are currently in the middle of our anime month, and uh, we just did High School of the Dead. And next week, we're doing Princess Jellyfish. That's what's going on there. Cool. Episode zero, I already mentioned it. We're talking about the prehistory of Star Wars. We just did an episode about John Carter slash the, uh, A Princess of Mars. Um, oh, yeah. a, the film, a book that inspired Star Wars, which then inspired the adaptation of that book. Kind of an interesting story. Um, and, uh, oh, I think I'm forgetting something. But uh, we also have on our Patreon, patreon.com slash critically acclaimed network. We have a ton of exclusive content on there. We have a podcast called All Our Yesterdays, where we're reviewing every single episode of Star Trek in production order. Wow. Uh, so I that's a that. big, that's going to take us like 10 years, but we're knee deep in it. We're about two thirds of the way through the original series right now. Do you so have guests for that? Catalog. Cause I'd Sometimes. love to come on that. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. sure. We'll talk. Okay. Uh, it's, it's harder with COVID because we prefer to do it in person and oh, like, fair. Quality, but we, we can make it work. Um, so we got that. Uh, we have a podcast called Only the Best, where we review every single film ever nominated for Best Picture. And we're currently in the middle of 1939, so that's exciting. Uh, we have a show called Not on Disney Plus, where we review stuff that should be on Disney Plus, but mysteriously is not. Mm. Uh, like this stuff that Disney is happy to sweep under the rug. Like um, we did all of the uh, Parent Trap sequels that nobody talks about. 
Oh, uh, that was a fun one. Uh, we cool. have commentary tracks. Uh, you can sponsor episodes of our show. Have us talk about anything you want. We have polls for future episodes, uh, and uh, we're in the middle of uh, polling people to talk about another Patreon exclusive. Uh, cult show that we can review episode by episode and right now the poll is between cowboy bebop twin peaks avatar the last airbender and something else which is probably winning but anyway uh so there's a lot of stuff there and of course i'm on twitter at william bibiani and the show is at critic acclaim there you go that's all the stuff for william bibiani it was my pleasure to have him on it was my honor to have him on uh so thank you so much william thank you. feel free to enjoy the rest of your night i'm gonna take this solo and uh, say good night to everybody uh it was awesome and we'll definitely have you back my man sure anytime take care Thanks. thank you again john it's been a pleasure me, me too brother and good luck on friday brother good luck on you friday. too you thank too you. All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. You've had the pleasure of hanging out with uh, William Bibiani there, a film critic, film pundit, film reviewer, one of the best dudes walking around, one of the most knowledgeable dudes walking around about film for sure. You know, these guys are very kind to let me into their worlds, let me into their sphere to talk about films. I'm a fan who became, who crossed that line, kind of like uh, uh, in the Field of Dreams. I crossed that line, and I be and I got to be a film a pundit, a reviewer. I don't call myself a critic. Those are for people like uh, Bibbs and McWeeny, but certainly a reviewer for sure. And I'm uh, always glad to talk movies and revisit old films uh, with people like that because I know I'm in good company and I'm back to being a film nerd again. Uh, and, you know, talking about a film down in the basement with friends. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you all had fun. Thank you so much for downloading or watching this uh, show or listening to us on the uh, podcast network remember the outlaw nation podcast network is there all the shows that you see on this on the channel all the reviews everything they are on the podcast network except for geek buddies geek buddies has its own thing uh so you know you can find that on it on its own feed uh, for podcasts but everything else on here this will be on probably tomorrow night i'll put it up on the podcast feed. if you haven't subscribed to the outlaw nation podcast feed please do so. The Outlaw Nation Podcast, wherever you download podcasts, the Outlaw Nation Podcast Network is there, and you can listen to everything we do here on the show. Don't forget, tomorrow, new episode of Geek Buddies will be dropping here on the channel. We've got the spectacular Spider-Man show we're dropping on Friday, where we uh, reunite the entire cast, and me, Shannon McClung, and Michael Vogel, the Geek Buddies, interview them about those first about those two seasons of the spectacular Spider-Man. You don't want to miss that. And of course, uh, we'll be doing the sports show tomorrow as well, but if you want to see me uh, hosting another show in the morning i will be hosting sen live over there for the yeshmoda entertainment network tomorrow morning christian asked me tonight maybe because he had a four-hour show with kevin smith he asked me to step in and uh, host the show there so come and watch me and hang out with our crew tomorrow on sen don't forget about the patreon that's right there patreon.com slash john roca uh all week this week since sunday uh hour and a half sessions of study sessions with my five dollar and above patrons coming in with a bunch of questions. Uh, there's, a, there's a massive uh, sheet we're using, and they're grilling me on everything to get me ready for the match. So if you come and become a patron, you can take a piece of my play, a piece of my victory if, I, if we pull it off on Friday uh, and own a little bit of it. So that's part of being a patron. As well. Plus, we've got all those shows we'll be doing once this these last two weeks of studying and getting ready for match, or three weeks of studying uh, kind of uh, goes away for a little bit. So come and be a part of that as well. Follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. Don't forget to hit subscribe down below. If you haven't subscribed, we had about four people subscribe during the show. Thank you so much. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button, that like button, and get us uh, as many likes as possible. The more likes, the more comments you leave, it helps in the algorithm uh, of this show to be seen by YouTube. Also, uh, uh, if you leave comments, if you're watching this later after we've done it live, and a lot of you do, please leave a comment below. Tell us what you thought about what we said, what Bibbs had to say. All that, leave it down there. Uh, the more comments, the more likes. As I said, it, it, it uh, raises the visibility of the show and this channel. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And thanks to Bibbs. Oh, and thank you to PC for a final $10 donation. Really appreciate it. Very kind of you, PC. Uh, uh, it's always good to see you roaming around in here and, uh, and giving support and some love to all the things we do. I want to make sure I don't miss any stream labs. Or super okay, everything was asked. Good to go. All right. We'll talk to you next week with another brand new episode of The Outlaw Nation. You take care of yourself. Yourselves. Be safe and don't forget to join us Friday night for a live pay per view on the Schmodown Entertainment Network. Two great matches. You're going to enjoy those, I think, and have a lot of fun. All right. Take care until then. We'll see you soon.